Dun, 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 dun. We can start it right. Let's go ahead and start the meeting. Hello. <laughs> We're officially starting the meeting. This is the uh, study session of June 16th. And it looks like we have one or two people lined up here for public comment. Public comment is restricted to items on the agenda. And since we have so many, we're particularly gonna be making sure that you do keep it to three minutes. All right, let's start with public comment. Up, we're going to do it up at the um, podium tonight. Do I have somebody here who do speak? Not a soul. <laughs> Whoop, here comes somebody. My name is Janice Hoppe, H-O-P-P-E. I live at 7000 West 35th Avenue. Um, my husband and I own Compass Construction on 38th Avenue, and um, we bought our building in 2010. When we bought our building, there were lots of for lease signs and um, several blighted other properties, including ours, which was very ugly, um, along 38th Avenue. We then spent six months, was sorry, six to eight months, uh, rehabilitating the property and moved our office from um, 44th and Tennyson into um, 38th Avenue. We also at the time had lived in Denver and when we bought our building we were looking at it as a good opportunity but the more time that we spent in the community and um, around the um, with the community members and um, engaged through Wheat Ridge 2020 um, we decided that Wheat Ridge was the place that we wanted to move our family. So then we moved our residence to Wheat Ridge. Um, the main reason why we opted to pick that property over, there were a couple others in Denver that we were looking at, was because we saw the um, plan for what was happening in Wheat Ridge on 38th Avenue. And um, we really wanted to be a part of that. And we really wanted to have a community where we had close-knit neighbors and could be part of a growing process. I know this plan has been in the works for a long time. I know it's taken a ton of work to get where it's at. I appreciate all the work that everybody's put into it. And I would just like to say, and I'd like to encourage you to continue forward with this plan and to um, continue to move our uh, city forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me remind anybody here who does plan to speak, if, if you're thinking that you'll speak at, when the item comes up, at study session we don't handle it that way. We put a, do all of the speaking, all public speaking, before the meet, at the beginning of the meeting, unless you know, you're called or for a specific reason. Does that changing something here? Okay. Um, I'm Michelle Del Piccolo, and I'm the um, sponsorship chair for the Wheat Ridge High School Farmers 5000. And I'm coming before you to um, encourage you to be sponsors of the race. The Farmers 5000 is one of the oldest road races in the Denver area. Um, we've raised over a half a million dollars, or <laughs> yeah, half a million dollars for the school in the past uh, 30 years. All of the money goes to academic and special programs at the school. Um, it, none of it goes to um, athletic programs or to, uh, to small groups. We take great pride in the fact that we try to 
hit every department so that all the, uh, the students at Weaver High School benefit from this race. Um, for instance, we've given money to the counseling department uh, for uh, peer counseling training. We funded the robotics program in the science department. Um, we purchased some iPads for interactive math programs. Um, what we've done, I was the race director for 10 years with the race, and now I'm the sponsorship chair. One of the things we did right around the year um, 2004 was we started to invite our feeder elementary schools in for an elementary school challenge. And what we're doing now is we will give a grant to the school that gets the largest percentage of their student body there. The purpose of that, we, the Farmers 5000 is such a Wheat Ridge community event. And we want everybody, um, all the families there, what it did when we invited these younger families to come, it introduced them to the neighborhood school, you know, to our local high school to keep those families um, with their students in the Wheat Ridge community. And um, like I say, the money, I mean, we, our sponsors are the ones who uh, pay for putting on the race, the radios, the barricades, um, the t-shirts, all of the expenses. That way, everybody's entry fee goes directly to the school. And um, we usually get about 800 runners out there. It's a, a big race. Other uh, races, other schools try to mimic our race, and they just don't have the success that we do because we have such a, a strong Wheat Ridge community and, and a strong alumni community. Um, and so what we would ask for is a sponsorship. In return, we would, um, you know, put Wheat Ridge uh, logos on the t-shirts, um, website, flyers, posters, and uh, just try to, to make it a true Wheat Ridge community event where it's not just the little high school. We get all of the all of the community, all of the young families out there. Um, and I, I thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Is there anyone else that wish, wishes to speak before the meeting? Rachel? Uh, I'm not supposed to know your name. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Rachel Haltine, and I'm the transition coordinator for Live Well Wheat Ridge. And uh, Live Well Wheat Ridge, after nine years of working with the city, has two weeks of a, a community coordinator. Um, so I'm really excited that I have the opportunity, while I'm still uh, officially employed, to get up here and speak out in support of the 38th Avenue corridor streetscape design. Um, I feel like I've been up and, and spoken about it a lot, but tonight is really exciting to actually see the conceptual design plans introduced to the community. I think up until tonight, it's been a lot of what we think it might be, and tonight we actually get to put real images to those those ideas. And I'd like to start by just thanking council and uh, city staff for all your hard work and the mayor for really listening to the community and really thinking about a context-sensitive design that really reflects our heritage. Unlike a lot of other Main Street retrofits um, with existing historic architectural buildings, we really get a sort of craft from scratch what we think that this, this corridor should look like. And I really appreciate that you've involved the community so much in that conversation. Um, so I've been asking myself, you know, who wants a Main Street district? Why, why are we this invested in this process? And in asking that question, um, I, I found that a lot of people want it. Um, did I just get my green light or did? Okay, <laughs> sorry, lights were flashing. Um, so the ARP Livable Communities Policy Board um, believes that walkable communities are uh, become great places for all ages, including seniors and, and youth in our community. The 2014 American Planning Association's National Opinion Survey of over 1,300 adults across the country shows a clear interest in placemaking among the concerns of Americans of all ages. But more importantly, two-thirds of all respondents believe investing in schools, transportation choices, and walkable areas is the preferred way to grow an economy. They also found commonality between millennials and baby boomers. They, um, this is a quote from the executive director, Paul Farmer. Millennials and baby boomers want cities to focus on investing in new transportation options, walkable communities, and making the area as attractive as possible. If there's a single message from this poll, it's that place matters. Thank you for your investment in this. Thank you. We have another speaker. Uh, 
I'm Adam Wiley, speaking for the Active Transportation Advisory Team tonight um, about Ridge at 38th. Uh, first of all, Adam Wiley. Adam. Yes. So first of all, I want to thank the city and staff for continually working hard on this project um, and for a walkable Main Street environment and bike-friendly designs, such as robust connections and ample parking and signage. Um, so the changes already made, and definitely the great changes out, posted out here will bring great active transportation accessibility to this Main Street area, which of course is very important uh, to, to us. Uh, we've already seen great new things at the Ridge of 38. There's clear community momentum to use that space and bring us together, such as last Friday and month, many other events that, that have been going on in that area. Um, of course, the economic development and the new, new businesses that, that we frequent. Um, and with the momentum, we have the promising work towards bike lanes on Pierce Street, uh, which will bring more people, uh, more residents of Wheat Ridge, as well as members of other communities uh, nearby, safely uh, to Wheat Ridge in an active way. Um, and then I just want to, you know, provide uh, this support and encourage the continued progress toward the, this publicly chosen designs and concepts, uh, offer any other support that the uh, active transportation team can provide. Um, finally, personal note, uh, we moved here uh, not too long ago um, because of the plans, because we wanted to be part of the plan, as mentioned earlier, uh, because of the great things we saw, um, which, um, you know, lots of, lots of places near Denver are near, near the city and near the mountains. This one was perfect for us because of the great things that were going on. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Okay, we have another speaker. Good evening, my name is Kelly Brooks. I live at 4100 Dudley Street here in Wheat Ridge. Um, and I came just to talk a, a little bit about 38th Avenue. Um, I moved to Wheat Ridge in 2003. I've worked in Wheat Ridge since 2001. Um, and my first opportunity to participate in public process here in Wheat Ridge was uh, as a part of the Citizens Advisory Committee for the uh, Comprehensive Plan. Um, that was back in 2007, I believe. And um, it's really uh, invigorating uh, for me to see now how some of those early conceptual thoughts and ideas that came out of that uh, process are, are beginning to come to fruition. And uh, so I want to encourage City Council to continue on that path, uh, carry out that vision. I think I speak for a lot of people that were on that group, um, that this is a, a part of that vision and part of what was getting that group excited five, six, seven years ago uh, and, and is now being realized. So uh, I'm, I'm here tonight to kind of watch the process uh, take place and, and learn a little bit more about the design and, and to encourage you to, to continue moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Another speaker? Good evening, I'm Britta Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. I'm the Executive Director of Wheat Ridge 2020 and a resident of District 1. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you all, as Kelly kind of did, that we've all been working on this for a long time. Uh, it's been the position of Wheat Ridge 2020 to resolve to support the 38th Avenue Corridor Plan, which came out of the comprehensive plan and a lot of planning before that. And one of the things that's very exciting to me is that this plan has ha able to have some steps that we've been able to see success and start to work that plan. In my um, efforts at Wheat Ridge 2020, I've been meeting with many property owners, many business owners up and down 38th Avenue. And uh, last week I was meeting with a substantial property owner who said, whatever happened to that Wadsworth plan? I worked on that and went to a lot of meetings. And it seems like this 38th Avenue plan, like we're, we're getting things done. And I just wanted to remind you of that because we still have a valuable plan for Wadsworth that may need some updating, but if people don't see progress, they feel like we're not doing things. So um, as you consider today uh, how far we've come in this concept design plan and consider what are the next steps, I'd encourage you to keep your foot on the gas pedal, to keep moving forward, um, keep producing the results, and, and keep getting toward that vision that we've all been planning for for, for so long. 
In addition to that, I want to remind you that indeed there are property owners working all along 38th Avenue, especially that Main Street district, to um, invest. And we have a group that's working on a petition for a business improvement district, as we've previously reported to you. So we'll be coming back to you in July with that. So that's continuing to move forward. And they're moving forward based on the fact that we expect the city will be moving forward. So I want to remind you of that. And then one last fun reminder. Um, Adam mentioned the great event we had Friday Night Live on 38th Avenue. And we have another great event this weekend. On Sunday is the Ridge at 38 Criterium. It's a short loop bicycle race, and uh, it's going to be like NASCAR and bikes. So come out and see the action. I have uh, handouts for all of our elected officials uh, to remind you. And there's also a letter here that went to the neighbors that were impacted by the closures um, for the streets. So we want you all to have that information as well. And we hope you can join us for the community ride. Get on your own bike and do a lap like the pros. We'll hope to see you on Sunday. Thanks. Thank you, Spurdo. Uh, hello, I'm Jevin Van Vliet. I'm a resident of Wheat Ridge. I live at 3837 Balsam Street. And I'm just here to show my support for what you guys are doing uh, for the 38th Avenue uh, redevelopment plan and uh, yeah, support and encourage you guys to keep moving forward with that. Thank you. Anyone else? Doesn't look like it. So I guess we can go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, staff reports Wheat Ridge Farmers 5,000 sponsorship. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in your packet is a, uh, a request that we've received from um, the high school for a um, sponsorship of the race. And um, we had a speaker this evening, so um, I'm not going to go into it any further. But there is a, a complete sponsorship packet in your um, in your council packet. So um, I think it's uh, important to make a decision on this um, now so that uh, the sponsorship, um, if you do decide to sponsor, that um, they can get the city's logo on 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 the materials so i think that's why we we needed to bring it to you tonight so miss davison so um i'm definitely in support of of a sponsorship from the wheat ridge farmers 5000 and i know there were some suggestions as far as doing a light item you know take it out of the budget as a non-budgeted item but I'm also thinking, is there a way that we could use our outreach dollars that we all put in, you know, a couple hundred, 400, you know, whatever we have to give to, to come up with that total? And I'm thinking, and of course, I'm speaking for everybody else and spending your money, but um, I'm thinking that that might be a way since it wasn't a budgeted item. And I know, like, for the Leaves of Hope, we did the we did 2,500, so maybe uh, we could come up with something around 1,500 to... 2000 that would be my thought any other thoughts on this so you're thinking not to make it a from the from the general funds but individuals contributing yeah, from their own yeah funds. But, you know depending on you know who, who's able to right you know to see what kind of dollar amount we could get but i know i'd be willing to put okay. in money from outreach and mr chilio I, I was thinking that since um we gave three thousand dollars to the kite group and that's a, that was a small group, and we're, this will affect 1,500 or 1,400 students. I was thinking that we do a $3,000 donation. Um, my concern is, is I don't have enough money to give to this through my public outreach right now because I've used it for other uh, opportunities. So I was hoping that we could do a budget amendment of $3,000, and if anybody wanted to kick in more money from their public outreach, we could. But I thought the 3000 would mimic what we did for the kites um, because – this is going to affect a lot of students and a lot of people and it's not for sports it's for academics and so what i would recommend is that necessarily we, if we wanted to do a budget amendment that we would put a resolution on the agenda for monday night with a empty amount and then when we made the motion to approve the budget amendment we could plug in the dollar amount on the uh, dias monday night that, that would give everybody a chance to look at their budget too and see what they had in their public outreach but i that was my goal was three thousand 
Mr. Fitzgerald. I'd be willing to uh, put some money in from my public outreach budget. I don't think we ought to uh, appropriate any money from the general fund. Okay. Any other? <coughs> Ms. Langworthy. Sorry. So the $1,000 that was um, given last year, did that come out of public outreach? Because it, it didn't come out of a budget, did it? Because it looks like we did it. Somebody gave them $1,000. I, I, as mayor, I've, I used to give them $1,000 out of my public outreach. But since we have less amounts as council members, um, and I don't have that much to give this year. So. Well, I, was just, I was just trying to clarify. Um, I did talk to Jen, and she would be more than happy to donate out of her um, public outreach money as well as, as I would. Um, I'd be okay with trying to get up to that, I guess, that major sponsorship level of 2,500. Um, I would be willing to give. Okay, so what I'm hearing is different individuals want to give from their individual budgets. Uh, and, and Mr. Dutilio is suggesting a, um, a, a fund, uh, uh, excuse me, that the city gives $3,000 just as we did for the kite festival. Well, I guess here's what I would recommend is, uh, like I said, we could leave the amount open, but I would recommend that we bring forth a resolution for $1,000, and then we can make up the 1500 by uh, the, the members' um, public outreach. So $1,000 on the resolution, and then 1500 be made. I don't have any money to give out of my, so I'd like to be able to give something through the city and be a sponsor. So if we could do $1,000 on the resolution for Monday night on the 23rd, and then the other 1500 would be made up by um, individual public outreach. But we might be able to cover it on your behalf. Well, without, I know you know, so, I mean, if you don't have it and we can cover it with our outreach, I guess, is, I guess then we wouldn't have to appropriate All funds right. that weren't budgeted, was my thought. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pond. Well, um, I think I agree with uh, almost everything. I think we should support it. I. Uh, realize there's a couple of different ways of going about it. I'm willing to, to um, look at my funds to support this. But since we can't probably do all the accounting tonight, it may make sense to bring a blank, a blank resolution forward, and we may decide we may be able to get all the funds gathered up before, before next meeting, and, and uh, it may be zero, um, or we may, get to, we may not have to take action on that item. Um, and if we fall short, we can uh, certainly fill in the blank and uh, make it up at that time. That would be my suggestion. Okay. May I have a consensus then for a resolution if that we can decide upon whether we're going to go that route or whether we're going to donate from our individual accounts and, and try to uh, make that a personal, you know, what our, our own decision shall be individually. Ms. Davis or Mr. Starker? I'd better go first. I've already spoken. Okay. Mr. Starker, please. Well, I was going to make a uh, consensus that we put a... Um, an item on the next council meeting that we uh, support the, the uh, Wheat Ridge Farmer 5000 and that we leave the uh, details of the funding mechanism to be decided at the council meeting. I agree with that. Do we have an agreement on that consensus? That's good. Do I, you understand that? Can I just one more thing? Sure. Um, is it possible that perhaps all of us could email Janice and let her know what we, we'd be willing to give out of our outreach funds. That way we have kind of a base dollar amount. I think that's a great idea. So could part we, of that consensus is. What, could, could we look at it in another way and each of us communicate with Janice and find out how much we have in our accounts? Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah. So if you, you know what, I'll yeah. have Janice send an Just email. The other way, yeah. I'll have Janice contact you all with an email saying this is how much you, you have, how much would you like to give? I think she already did that. She already did that. She already did that. Few yeah. weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the math is 2,500 divided by eight is 312, 2,500 divided by nine is 277. I don't think we've decided on a specific amount, have I'm we? Not, I'm just Just giving. making comment. I, I wanted to give council a heads up too. Uh, in the past, our, the council funds was $1,500 for public outreach and $1,500 for meeting budget. And Janice had told me that inadvertently or, or on the last budget, the meeting budget was cut down to 1100. 
So that's why I'm $400 short, and I, I think we all are. So Patrick was going to check to make sure that um, that was correct, because if we do have 1500 each, then I still have some funds left available. But I would like to do the 2500 or 3000 but I like the idea of bringing the resolution forward blank, and then we can ch check with Janice to see how much money we have and go from there. So, And then, then the committee will know Monday for the, the total amount then. That sounds like 2500 maybe, so... So can you, can you check with Janice um, in the morning and see if we're off by $400 for each yep. account? Okay. Are you good? Yep. All right. Can we move on to the um, second item, which is the uh, conceptual streetscape design for 38th Avenue? Um, That's why they're all sitting around here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got uh, Deanna Svetlik, our consultant from Intellikey, here this evening. Uh, she's going to go th walk us through a PowerPoint here, kind of show the uh, uh, the final conceptual design here for the uh, the Phase Two design for the 38th Avenue streetscape improvements. And when uh, uh, when Deanna is done with her presentation, um, Deanna and staff are available to answer any questions you may have on the concepts. And uh, after after some questions and answers on that, we can we can then talk about next steps here in the process. So. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Deanna. Or Dina. It's okay. <laughs> um, thanks for having me this evening. So we are going to be going through actually four different items this evening. So and all four of these items are touching on the contract um, that was approved by council earlier this year. So the first item on the agenda is the update on the streetscape concept design, the second phase of the work. And then I'll also touch upon um, the side street analysis that we completed, some signage and wayfinding, and the green, which is the area in front of the middle school. So first, the streetscape design, the second phase of that work. Just to remind everybody of, of um, where we started with this, last July was the beginning of the first phase of the um, conceptual streetscape design work and that work really went through December of last year. At that point we had two different alternative concept designs. We had a public meeting, um, we met with the leadership committee um, and had block by block outreach during that first phase. That first phase also focused geographically from Upham to Pierce. Then in February of this year, uh, council approved the phase two of the contract which included um, getting to a preferred alternative and also looking at an expanded geographic area that went from Upham all the way through Pierce and over to Newland slash Marshall with the jog in the street blocks. So we began that work in February. We're here at June and again through that process we've had a public meeting, um, an open house, uh, block by block outreach and we've met with the leadership committee of Wheat Ridge 2020. So the purpose of the meeting tonight really um, of council is fourfold. It's first uh, requesting for policy direction on accepting the conceptual design. Secondly, proceeding with the street width designation. Uh, proceeding with the survey work of the street, which is needing to, needed to complete any further design of the concept design, or the streetscape design rather. And then proceeding with preliminary design itself. So those are the four items that we're looking for council uh, policy direction on this evening. So again, just to remind everybody of the geographic area, uh, the first phase of the uh, planning effort began from Upham on the west um, and went over to Pierce Street on the east. And that was the first phase, again, where we had alternative concept designs and basically was from last Ju July through December. The second phase, which we began in February of this year, again, focused on a preferred concept design, and geographically, we've expanded and, and moved over to the east to uh, Marshall and Newland Streets. So what does the streetscape design do? I think first and foremost, and you've heard this a lot from um, both internally the staff through 
um, and Teleki and our consulting through this process, as well as many of the advocates for the streetscape, that the first thing is really about branding and placemaking for Wheat Ridge, for your Main Street, for your downtown. If you think about all of the different commercial corridors um, in the community, and I know I added this up, I think, in the first phase, and I'm forgetting the total length, but if you think of all the commercial corridors between 44th and Wadsworth and Kipling, um, some on Harlan, and as well as 38th, that total miles, we're basically looking at just over a half mile in length to create something very distinctive and different within the city. That you're saying, making the decision consciously to say, within this half mile of our community, we are creating that walkable Main Street and that distinct identity for the community. So branding and identity and placemaking is first and foremost. Um, the second item is identifying conceptual changes to on and off street parking configurations. Third is enhancing and highlighting bus stop location and configurations uh, for greater mobility and options with um, transit or transport. And lastly, addressing access enhancement. So at the conclusion of phase one in December, this is just a summary slide of the council direction that we received at that time. So during that meeting, we presented the two alternatives, um, again, when I didn't have a voice. Uh, we presented the two different, or Mark rather, presented the two alternatives. Um, and the council direction at that time was to move forward with the flexible design. And what does that mean? So the, the series of bullets you see here is really a summary from that flexible design, which was the preferred direction from council at that time. So it was really about street trees and grates, uh, planter pots, mostly having chairs instead of traditional benches, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the design, having unique both pedestrian level lights or lower level lights, as well as matching street lights or high level lights, um, having unique paving patterns in the amenity zone, which is the zone between the curb and the sidewalk, um, the, the location typically where you have chairs, benches, trash receptacles, trees, things like that. So that's the amenity zone. So there would be unique paving in the amenity zone as well as in the crosswalks where pedestrians are crossing the street. Um, as I mentioned before, the unique bus stops. Um, there, the idea of soft curving lines and really this more blonde coloring or wheat coloring that is a subtle reflection of, of Wheat Ridge um, as a community in the history, but also a subtle reflection of the mid-century time um, when the community really boomed. And so this is a preferred kit of parts board. Um, for those council members that were, were here in December, um, we had two different alternatives at the time. So this is simply reflecting the um, preferred kit of parts that's in the conceptual streetscape design. Um, some of the elements that you can see are the idea of having um, tree grates, again, a pretty simple pattern, nothing too elaborate. Um, that would be a, a, around trees to protect them. Um, the idea of that special paving pattern that would be in the amenity zone or in the crosswalks, again, would be that more wheat color um, in design and also be more elongated and linear, um, a la the, the types of brick um, that were found uh, mid-century. Um, and then some of the other images are just reflecting some of the other ideas in terms of possibilities for light fixtures that have a soft curve to them. Um, the idea of having chairs that could be clustered to create conversational areas on the street and so forth. So walking through um, two different areas of the plan. So as many of you know, there's really two primary right-of-ways that exist along the street, along the study area. And there's a wider section basically from Upham to just east of the High Court intersection, and that's approximately a 70-foot right-of-way. And then east of that, the right-of-way actually narrows down to 60 feet. So we've created two prototypical uh, layouts of what that streetscape would look like in plan. So this is the first one with the 70-foot right-of-way. And because we have the additional space, um, that allows us to maintain on-street parking on at least one side of the street. Now this, this um, prototypical layout that you're seeing is actually right in front of the middle school grounds, and in that case, we have um, a right-of-way that's even larger, so we're able to have on-street parking on both sides of the street in that particular location. So uh, in the 70-foot right-of-way, there's on-street parking, at least on one side of the street. It's sort of the, the yellowish wheat color that you see here is reflecting that amenity zone. Again, the, the space between the curb of the street and the through zone of the sidewalk where pedestrians would be walking. Um, so that's indicated in that color. 
There would be locations um, to accommodate handicap parking as part of the parallel parking on the street. Uh, and then at pedestrian crossings, we are actually expanding the amenity zone in what we typically call bulb outs. So we're actually pulling the curb out even further so that it's minimizing that pedestrian crossing distance across the street, basically to um, just the three lanes of travel. And so within those zones creates uh, unique opportunities for those seating or gathering areas where we would cluster the chairs, um, have planters creating those outdoor rooms. Um, creating those gathering places for people to stay and linger and have places for folks to meet up with others um, before going to dinner or before going to an event and so forth. Um, the amenity zone, again, is also location for items like trash and recycling, receptacles, bike racks, and other amenities. Um, that is also where the pedestrian lights and the typical street lights would be located. And then you can also see the what I mentioned previously, that at the crosswalks, there would be unique crosswalk paving, so we're really highlighting that pedestrian environment and um, sending a cue to those that are in vehicles to slow down and watch for pedestrians as they're crossing the street. So moving to the 60-foot right-of-way, um, now we're basically losing that on-street parking, unfortunately, just because of the confines of the existing right-of-way. Uh, but that um, the 60-foot right-of-way still allows us to have the three lanes of travel, the amenity zone and the sidewalk uh, with all of the amenities that were mentioned um, in the 70 foot right of way. And so now I'll just walk through a series of, of images that are taken at different locations along the street so you can get a sense of what that place could be in the future. So this particular view is looking east at Upham, a little bit of an aerial view. So this is the middle school grounds on the um, left-hand side. And you can see again where that unique crosswalk pavement would come across for pedestrians. The bulb outs at the intersections would provide a greater area for seating and gathering um, for plant material and other amenities within the streetscape. And you can see the existing um, over the street banner in the distance here. The next view is, is turning around 180 degrees and moving down the street a little bit. This is looking west near Teller. Um, I think the, the highlight of, of this view is really, you know, there's some really great opportunities where the bulb outs get to be quite extensive, um, given the opportunities that exist along the street. And so, a la this idea of creating little conversational chair areas, you can see that some of these bulb outs are actually large enough where you could actually create two groupings of chairs. Um, a lot of times people, you know, many streetscapes that I'm sure everybody is familiar with, you see traditional benches and a lot of people don't like sitting next to a total stranger on a six foot or a five foot bench. And so the idea of having the chairs is that you're creating a little bit more intimate environment and having people be a little bit more comfortable perhaps sitting next to a stranger in that environment. So you can also see then how the planters can be used to basically sort of create those outdoor rooms, those outdoor living rooms for people to gather. Um, you can see how the street trees and grates would be placed within that amenity zone that would have the unique paving. So moving on, or actually coming down to grade, um, this is looking west near Teller. And this slide just really shows how, because of the, the wider sidewalk environment, there are, are additional opportunities to encourage and um, accommodate outdoor cafes along the street. So again, you're adding to that uh, liveliness of the street environment by having outdoor cafes um, adjacent to the street while still accommodating a clear through zone for pedestrians and ADA access moving down the sidewalk. This is looking west at High Court. Um, this is, again, one of the signalized intersections where we have the unique pedestrian crosswalks at all four intersections because we know that this is a high pedestrian environment. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had the unique crossings at that location. Um, another element to point out here is because of the unique condition in front of Wheat Ridge Cyclery, we are still having the continuous sidewalk pull back away from the street and up against the building, but it's a wider sidewalk um, and the connection between the flow along the street and to that sidewalk, which would be against the building, um, will be much more um, user-friendly and visible for a pedestrian. What that also does is it provides another opportunity for sort of a bulb out um, location where this is just one example where public art could be incorporated along the street. 
So not only in this bulb out location, but some of the other bulb outs along the street as well. So opportunities for public art along the street. This is looking east near, near Reed Street, um, just simply showing as you're moving a little bit further east along the street, um, as the right of way becomes a little bit more constrained, you still have the amenity zone, you're still able to uh, perhaps cluster a couple of chairs, set back a little bit away from, from the curb, um, facing the sidewalk, so again, little conversation areas for people to stop and rest and, and take a break as they're walking up or down the street. So this view is looking east at Pierce. So now we've um, continued the, in the second phase of the work, we moved east of Pierce and continued the streetscape design. And so with that, Pierce is another one of those important intersections that signalized, and so we want to have the specialized crosswalks at all four um, locations on that intersection for pedestrian movement across um, both east, west, and north, south across the various streets at that intersection. There's also opportunities here um, based on existing easements to incorporate a low wall. So we don't have a lot of low walls that are identified in, in the design because, again, we're trying to keep it as clean and streamlined as, as possible. That was part of the direction we received in December. However, there are a couple of unique locations where we are showing very simple low walls with the Ridget 38 logo just sandblasted into that wall. Um, and as Pierce is, is a sort of a gateway intersection to the main street from people coming from north to south, we thought that would be a good location for those four walls. There's also opportunity, um, it varies, each condition is unique, but there's opportunities for landscaping at grade or in the ground at those locations, at that intersection. So coming down to grade, still looking east at Pierce, um, what this shows you is that um, the improvements to bus stops. So we're proposing a unique bus shelter um, with an integrated informational component into the bus shelter. So there would be information, perhaps a map of the district, information on what restaurants or businesses are located on the district. There might be opportunities for a more traditional takeaway pamphlet um, at that location. That was one of the um, decisions that came out through the second phase process where we originally were showing individual kiosks and we thought again to really stick with the idea of having um, less clutter along the street and a streamlined streetscape, why not simply just integrate that information into the unique bus stop? So they really become an icon um, for folks um, using the street. And as transit users are getting off the bus stop, um, uh, off the bus, the information is right there for them to take a look at and find out where they need to go. This image also shows um, the concept of parking lot screening. So part of the streetscape design is, is um, identifying uh, parking lot screening for private lots, parking lots that would still be up to the street edge so that you're not seeing the cars uh, directly on the street, but rather they're screened with a low fence and some sort of landscape. So another view looking west at Newland, this one just shows one concept of how that parking lot screening may occur. Um, again, so that the parking lots that exist, um, they will remain in their current location. However, we're at least screening them from headlights from pedestrians walking by and really creating that public realm environment of the street. So cost estimates. Um, we had preliminary cost estimates in the alternatives phase. We've refined those cost estimates um, and um, completed the cost estimates for the additional geographic area. The cost estimates include um, survey and final design, full road reconstruction um, of the street of 38th Avenue, um, the access enhancement components, uh, creation of an amenity zone, new streetlights and pedestrian lights, provision of the seating, landscaping, and other streetscape amenities or street amenities, electrical for special events that would be incorporated into the street, and as I mentioned, again, the special bus stops. And so the conceptual level cost estimates from Upham to Pierce came in at approximately 5.3 million. Um, in the expanded area from Pierce to Marshall, that came in at about 2.7 million. And then we also looked at private property improvements. Um, because of the access enhancements that are being completed um, and some of the changes that are being proposed, there will be modifications to the private property. And so we also estimated those costs. And again, they're split out in the two geographic areas, Upham to Pierce being approximately $700,000 and Pierce to Marshall approximately $600,000. 
So with that, um, just repeating the request for policy direction, and at this time we will take any questions and answer and have a discussion. Mr. Fitzgerald, do you have a question? I, I know that one of the goals was to reduce ingress, outgress, to uh, create some shared places, uh, shared parking lot access. How, how many places were you able to re reduce uh, the ingress and outgress? That's, that's a great question. And I know, again, I had calculated that for the first phase, and I don't think, um, actually, we did calculate. I think it was about three or four we reduced in the second phase, or from Pierce to Upham, approximately. And I'm forgetting the number now of, of what that reduction is um, from Upham to Pierce. But we can get that number for you. The other, the other thing we did related to that was some of the some of the properties have parking that back out into the street, and so their curb cuts 100 feet wide or 120 feet wide. Is we've got those designed to have a discrete driveway within parking off the street, so we won't have people backing out over the sidewalk and, and into the street anymore. So that was the other another big improvement over what we've got today. Ms. Davis. So that was a little bit of my question on when you showed the picture on by Wheat Ridge Cyclery and that great little bulb, as you call it. Um, but then it had that widened sidewalk. So that right now is parking. And it's like in front of Fran's Cafe. And, mm -hmm. and that. so is that parking going away? And then we're going to have that little parking somewhere else, as you were referring to? Or is that parking still going to be there? That parking will still be in front of that store. So yeah. basically, the, the current walk that exists between the current parking and the building will actually be expanded. It'll get widened um, and will still be accommodating angled parking in that zone. Okay. But we're also able to then add in the amenity zone between the street and where that parking would so be. So the located. sidewalk next to the building will be bigger, mm -hmm. and but there'll still be parking yes. right in front. Mr. Starker. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I noticed when we were uh, in our package, we had talked about uh, the uh, area, bless you, in front of the high school, in front of the elementary school, we call the green. Have we done any, you know, the public public gathering space there? Has there any been sort of any conceptual design work done on that? That's next on the agenda. Okay. <laughs> then I will I will put that oh, question off. Um, if I could follow up. Uh, but, but yes, we have. Good. <laughs> That's what I inferred from that answer. Um, uh, for you, Mark, are we able to, or do you think it's possible for us to do the survey work in-house, the as-built survey? We've, we've had some conversations about trying to do the survey and the design in-house. We're, we're a little concerned about capacity just because depending on how much we do, if we do the entire street all at once, that'll be pretty tough for us. If we break off a smaller piece, we might be able to do some of that in-house. We'll, um, the budget numbers include 15% um, for engineering and then 10% for construction administration, which is the inspection, all those kind of things. Those are sort of typical numbers for, for our part of the world for that. So there's a pretty hefty number out of that $9 million total that, that is for engineering and design. Certainly if we can do some of that in-house, we just haven't finished those conversations about what we think we can, we can pull off with our forces and how busy we are on other things and, and that kind of thing. Also depends on how quickly we go forward and what other projects we get in the in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, and I had one more. Just um, on the on the custom bike on the custom bus shelters, is that is that truly a custom made item, rather than or or is, and are we paying a significant premium for that? I guess is more the more the, the point. It's yet to be determined whether it'll be fully custom um, for Wheat Ridge or whether it's a custom meaning different from an RTD standard. Right. Um, so the, the image that you've seen is actually um, produced by a manufacturer. So it's an existing shelter that could be purchased and there's some different options for modifying it um, versus actually designing a very unique, you know, 100% and and unique. And the same might apply to the to the light fixtures and and the other the, other items in the kit of parts so that we're not the light, yeah, and uh, the light fixtures, um, for the most part, I mean, we haven't really had this conversation, but um, I would envision those to be an existing fixture that is available through a manufacturer. Thank you. Um, 
On the uh, additional costs for private property improvements, does that include any kind of uh, redo of property owners' signage or uh, of their existing signage? Um, it doesn't. This is mostly physical things on the parking lots. Um, for instance, um, where the family tree business is, not their, not their office, but where their business is there next to e recyclery, um, their, their entry and exit, we're going to swap those. It make, it, the traffic works out a lot better that way with, with sharing an interest with recyclery. And so we have to restripe their lot. And, and not knowing the condition of the lots and some of the lots not being in great shape, we'd actually what those cost estimates include is basically overlaying the lot rather than trying to blast off the striping. We're assuming they're not in great shape. We'd have to overlay the lot and then put new striping down. So um, that's what those include. It's not a signage thing. That's, that's, if there's a sign in the way, we'll pick it up and move it, but we'd salvage the existing sign is what you typically do in those situations. Um, so the $9.3 million, because I see uh, several instances where the place where someone's existing sign is, it, it's no longer a viable spot for that so that's just going to be the old sign's going to be picked up and then moved is yeah we have dollars in there to relocate the signs but not to provide new ones to the to the business owners and that doesn't conflict i know in some cases business owners haven't changed their sign because it's sort of a um i don't know what the right term is non-conforming right right so even though they're ex currently non-conforming they can remain non-conforming even though you've moved them? Yeah, because if it's a city action, if it's a government action, if CDOT comes in and does something or if we come in and do something that moves the sign, we're doing the same thing on Kipling Street, the sign still is legally non-conforming because they're not the ones that have touched it. We've touched it and we're not going to make somebody change out their sign just because, you know, we've come along and moved it to somewhere else. And the uh, how long is the estimate of the uh, construction period over the eight blocks or so again that'll depend really heavily on how we phase this and what we do and we obviously can't just tear up the entire street at once and, and work on that we'd have to work on you know south halves north halves pieces parts and those kind of things we haven't really talked about construction estimates not knowing where we might be going um dollar wise and, and how big of a scope the original project initial project will do but and this might be an unfair uh comparison but or trying to figure this out, comparing it to other projects, whether it be in Wheat Ridge or in other municipalities, the price tag of 9.3 divided by eight blocks is like 1.1 per block. Is that a, a reasonable cost for uh, projects like this in other areas? Have we seen other municipalities spend a million dollars a block to fix up a downtown area, or are there any kind of comparables to that? Yeah, we, we sort of looked into that a little bit towards the end of the process. We actually went over, before our, our last meeting with you guys, we actually went over to Tennyson and drove Tennyson, and we got estimates from Denver. I don't remember those off the top of my head. Their, their dollar per block number was lower, but if you look at what they did on Tennyson, it, it wasn't nearly as impactful as this. They, they didn't do nearly as many of the things that we're proposing to do to make this a really special place. I think um, some of the other places that were thrown out was uh, potentially Cherry Creek. Some of the work they're doing along some of the streets down there, this will be more comparable to that with the level of amenity zone and, and those kind of things. And, and uh, what we hear is those numbers are fairly, fairly comparable to what we're doing. We, we look at just what we do in the city. You know, we just spent five and a half million dollars at 32nd and Youngfield, and we didn't make that one real pretty at all. It was just, that was just redoing the intersection and stuff. And um, we're gonna spend almost $3 million on Kipling to get a trail for, um, you know, it's, it's a mile and a quarter, but it's not all of that. It's about half that where we're actually building. And that's just throwing a 10 foot trail down on, on the side of the road and getting ped lights. We're not getting in mini zones and stuff. So we, we think we're probably in a ballpark of, of what that might cost. And, and again, we're, we're creating a really special place here is what our goal is. Thank you. And I can just follow up on that. We, some of the research that we did in looking at some of the different streetscapes, basically what we've found, um, and these were all primarily in the Denver metro area, is that a streetscape design could, it can range anywhere from approximately just over $1,000 per lineal foot to over $5,000 per lineal foot, depending on the type of finishes and so forth. So for in instance, 14th Avenue, 14th Street in downtown Denver was at that higher end at about $5,000 uh, per linear foot. So, um, and Tennyson was on the lower end. And so you come in right about in the middle, basically. Of, of where those different streetscape amounts per lineal feet um, ended up being? Um, actually, I think for the fact that we're even putting in new street lights, it's pretty, I mean, this is a pretty complete, fully removed and replaced. I do have a, a question. 
or a, a comment or whatever. First of all, I want to comment on the vertical um, idea of vertical flower baskets. I like that versus the hanging. I thought that was a nice touch. Um, my biggest concern, is, as some of you all know, is as far as the art component of it, that to make sure that there is room for, for the art pieces. Um, and, and there's been quite a bit of talk for the last couple of years, uh, and I've been involved in it, creating an art loop, uh, which means that the art goes up and down the street with the concept of being a, people wanting to walk down the street, they have their dinner and they enjoy it. Uh, so I just want to make sure that, that uh, those areas, those pedestals are, are going to be placed so that that can, can occur. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also opportunity for, I mean, I think we, a lot of us think of art pieces as some three-dimensional vertical sculpture or piece that comes up from the ground. Oh, I think absolutely. there's also opportunities for, say, art to be incorporated into the sidewalk or into the amenity zone so it becomes sort of a learning experience that you come upon it as you're walking down the street, not necessarily an art piece that you're seeing uh, 500 feet down and then walk up to it. So I think there's different opportunities to incorporate art um, as well. Gives them a reason to walk further, maybe something kinetic, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Great. Mr. Pond. Thank you. Uh, I want to also echo uh, thanks for the work uh, on the plan. I think this is a great um, next step. I've got a couple of questions, bef um, and I assume we might get into comments and, and other things as we go through the uh, direction that you're looking for. Uh, on page two of the um, report, you um, you briefly just update us that um, additional community input process block-to-block -block meetings east of Pierce between Pierce and, and Marshall took place. I think the reason why this is unique to this phase two plan obviously is the geographic extension of the design area. Indicate you know you indicated that you had done some of these meetings in the phase one. Um, and uh, you also indicate that there are some changes or some comments from those meetings that you ultimately then reflected back into the plan. So my question in, for that is in two parts. One, how did those meetings go? If you were to just give me just a snapshot of how they went and kind of some of the feedback that you got and maybe more specifically if you could point out some of the things that um, uh, um, the input that, that may have uh, modified the plans, could you, in, could you point those out or one or two anyway? Sure, and I think um, in terms of the block-by-block -block meetings, the um, majority of the input that we received in terms of um, in terms of comments was some of the access um, enhancement, and that's the main purpose of or, that we had those meetings to really show everybody exactly how their access may be modified on their property. Um, and based on that, I believe we at least in two locations. Um, perhaps in three, ended up modifying the draft plans that we had for access enhancement. We, we actually, we actually modified even more than that. You just forgot. We we changed quite a bit of things based on the the input from the folks. Uh, I know Steve Art and I went out and publicly knocked on every door that was on that stretch to hand out invitations. After also mailing them out, we had pretty good participation. We probably had at least half the corridor show up. Um, for those meetings, different business owners and things like that, and you know they expressed their concerns, and we incorporated those. I know that at one point we were we were reducing the parking at Crest Kitchen by a lot, and he said we can't do that, and so we relooked at the plan, and we we got most of that parking back, and um, input from a dental office that well, this is where my employees park, so if we do it this way, it would be just fine, and so a lot of that kind of kind of input, and we also followed back up with some folks from Phase One. We followed back up with. Um, the folks at Dave's Automotive, we followed back up with Recyclery, and also um, during the neighborhood meeting, we had a lot of conversation with um, the property that is uh, where the BNF Tire is, and also the property right next to them, because the property next to them are really being impacted by the plan. And so we had a lot of conversation about what's going on there, what we could do, maybe do in the future, and those kind of things. So um, we think that was a really good process. It, it, it helped us to, because we don't run the business, we don't know what, how people get in and out, and those kind of things. So Great, I appreciate that detail. My second question, I'm, I'm going to, just for the sake of it, refer to page 18 and 19 um, in, at a couple of those images. And it looks like you're, you're um, modeling saving many existing trees along uh, with the new trees. So you're modeling both existing and 
and new trees, obviously to, to what it looks like to create a very dense planted area, which I like. I assume that, um, that uh, you, you have some confidence that you can do that, but that you'll, uh, that you'll, when you get the survey and some of the next level of design, that you'll prove out that you can, that you can, uh, can do that. I just wanted to make sure that my assumptions are correct. I think most of the, I mean, in terms of the images, and if you're looking specifically at page 18, um, the trees that are shown back of sidewalk, so basically on the private property, um, are existing in that case, and, and we don't think that we're going to be impacting the trees on private property for um, most of the length of, of the district. The trees that um, may be impacted and a decision needs to be made after they're fur further evaluated and after a survey is complete is the existing trees um, within the existing amenity zone, primarily to the west, sort of between Upham and um, Teller. Got it. Thank you. Additional questions? Mr. Fitzgerald? I am uh, confused. Uh, normal state, some people would say. <laughs> on, the, on page 13 of the uh, booklet, it shows um, parallel parking. Uh, looking east at Upham. In the text uh, of the report, it uh, talks about um, in item number two, page number four, uh, west of High Court, it may be feasible to remove the back end parking if an early action project could be completed. Uh, and then there's another place in the report that talks about. Um, a 12 foot wide parking strip at the same part. I'm really confused as to, you know, what is what here. So what's shown in the images is, is the final design with eight foot wide parallel spaces with the new curb gutter and everything else that's going on. What is in the staff report, I don't know that Dina ever saw that, so that's what he's, that's what he's asking about, Dina. Um, in the staff report, we had, we had contemplated the idea of trying to get rid of the back end parking sooner rather than later. And so, so I looked at I looked at the design of, of where the future curb is going to be and those kind of things. I hate building stuff and then throwing it away. Um, and so, if we if we go ahead and sort of build that area from Upham to High Court in its future location, just go ahead and build that curb and gutter where it's going to be. We end up with 12 feet between that and the bike lane, um, which could be a parallel space. You could stripe a buffer zone in between the bike lane and the parallel parking, and that would still work fairly well. So, so that's what's going on with that little bit of confusion. Those that discussion is not reflected in the summary booklet because that's not part of the conceptual design. That's an idea of if we, if we want to get rid of the parking back in parking sooner than later, there's a way to do that and still incorporate the final design in such a way we're not putting in curb and gutter and then a year or two later tearing it back out again because I hate doing that kind of thing. So. Mr. Urban. With respect to the uh, total cost at 9.3, does that include a contingency amount for cost overruns and the like, or is that exclusive of that amount? Yeah, so, so the 9.3 total is based on the construction cost being a set amount and a 30% contingency for all the different pieces, parts. So there's a 30% added on to that um, when we do well, this conceptual level stuff for things that we might run into. For the... Um, survey and the construction and then plans? There's, and then there's, so there's, there's, a, there's a construction amount, there's a 30% contingency, then added on to that is 15% for engineering, design, survey, that kind of thing. And then another 10% added on for, um, for construction management, inspections, and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, certainly if we do some of those things in-house, we're already paying city staff, and so we save some of those dollars, but um, I totaled it up earlier, it was maybe a million and a half of the total 9.3 is, is, is engineering and design and then construction management if we were to hire someone to do all of those things for us. Um, so, you know, we're looking at a somewhat smaller number, but there's a pretty good, there's a pretty healthy contingency in there, but that's because we're at 30%. We're, we don't have survey yet, we, we're missing a lot of things. So we've got a 30% contingency. Certainly as we proceed forward, we'd narrow that contingency down to 20% at preliminary design and then generally 10% at final design. Mr. Starker. Um, thank you. Um, how, um, how does your parking count look sort of on an aggregate scale when you look at the private parking and the public parking that we're, that we're putting out there, but particularly the private parking 
the number of spaces that are available for people to come? Is it sort of a net gain, net loss, about the same, too soon to tell? I, I have a warm fuzzy about it, but I don't have a real number. Dina might remember the real number. Um, I, do, I don't remember the, the exact numbers. Um, I believe we had some numbers in the phase one summary book. So I, I know that we tried to, to with, with the addition of the parallel spaces that we've got sort of in that western end, I think our aggregate is we've probably gained a couple here and there. Okay. I know that we worked really hard. We recycled, we was going to lose like five with the original design we had. We've got them back to the point of that, that whole block there, that whole area in front of them is losing maybe one space, but then we've got a lot of parallel spaces going in. Okay. Um, so it's that kind of a thing. I don't remember the number, but I know I've looked at the chart and thought, well, I think we landed pretty well on this. Um, I don't think we're losing. We, we're not wiping out except for that. The only business we're severely impacting is, is the one right next to, to BNF Tire. They go from four spaces to two. But we've promised them that after we get survey done, we'll do whatever we can to try to get those spaces back. And we're going to meet with them and, and try to work that out and possibly meet with the owner next door to get a shared parking arrangement with them. Because they already, they already sort of share a drive aisle and some parking in the back and stuff. So, And then um, just to be clear, the, the, the new scheme, the design scheme, does away with, with back end parking and head end angle parking. So we, yes, only, it's have, all parallel. we only have parallel parking. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And then we, uh, council came back and in the, at the, you know, sometime at our last meeting, I don't have the time frame, but ask, uh, ask our designers to go back and take a look at um, uh, Pierce to Marshall and Newland. And, you know, we, we, we put about three, three, three and a half million dollars in the budget to do that. Um, does that, from a design standpoint and a and a, a presence in the street, is that uh, is that a good is that a good thing to do? I, I think overall it probably is. Um, I think you know when you look at our corridor from from Upham to Pierce is very commercial, you know, very Main Street ish, especially if we do this project. Um, if we if we didn't continue eventually continue all the way to where family tree is at Newland Marshall area It seems like we suddenly have a gap where there's more commercial stuff and we didn't do anything You know after that there's a lot more residential It's a much more residential feeling kind of a street that residential area that was identified in the in the corridor plan that residential sub district I think it feels very different um, Certainly be nice someday to go ahead and do something in that part of it, too, but but it feels like by in, incre increasing to the uh, total Main Street sub-district that we had in the quarter plan, that now we've got everybody in that's, that's really part of our Main Street. I think it does make sense. Okay. Thank you. We do, if I could respond to that too, we do have um, some interest in some properties um, east of Pierce, um, through in the main, it's still in the Main Street district up to Marshall that um, are, you know, they're looking at um, redevelopment to, into more of a Main Street feel. So, um, I think there's potential um, for the Main Street to, to really be focused between Upham and all the way down to Marshall Newland with, with, with these new property redevelopments if they do come, come forward. Mr. Fitzgerald. In, in light of that, the, the uh, low walls that are at Pierce kind of have a border feel to them. If we're gonna have new development east of Pierce, um, should we have these low walls right at that corner? And does anybody else have the sort of the borderline feel because of those low walls? We, uh, just a point of clarification, we also have a low wall on the western edge um, on the south side of the street near Upham. Sure. You're worried that it sort of cuts it off? Is there anything at Marshall Newland? We, we didn't currently show anything at the Marshall Newland on the east edge simply because we didn't have any, um, there wasn't a lot of room in the public right of way. Um, but there might be an opportunity in working with private property owners to um, incorporate a wall or possibly to incorporate a smaller scaled wall within the amenity zone. That's kind of in the middle of the ridge. Is that kind of? some of the purpose of the lower walls in there? Because it's announcing the ridge at 38th. <coughs> right, right. So it's incorporating the ridge at 38 logo into the streetscape design outside of um, so the banners that you see there now would be continued on the new light fixtures. But we were looking at... Further, which do expand it more than... 
Mm -hmm. And I think part of it with what's, Pierce is a real gateway. I mean, that's the main north-south connection for people that are from outside the neighborhood that are immediately around. And so we want people to know they've arrived. And by putting them all four corners, we think it, it serves as a focal point. We have a real focal point at High Court um, where we have a signal. And so there's a lot of stuff going on there. There's opportunities for public art. There's the bulb outs and all those kind of things. And our thought was that that with Pierce is another focal point that's sort of a third of the way down, if you will. They're both sort of at third points. They give another fo focal point for people coming in on bicycles, on the new bike lanes that are going in, and, and also just for people walking in or driving in. It says, you're here now. Scatter east and west and, and come shop with us. Come shop with us. <laughs> Ms. Langworthy. I just I have a couple little questions. So over at High Court, um, having been using it over the last couple weekends, um, with this new plan, is there any, any indication that we might be able to put like a turn signal there? Because when you get all those people crossing, it really becomes challenging to make that kind of left, go north onto High Court. Yeah, this, this plan includes redoing the traffic signals at both High Court and Pierce and incorporating things like accessible pedestrian buttons and all the stuff that's going to make this just as, as, as easy as possible for folks that are that are ambulatory and also impaired in some way, be they visual or physically, that they can get around. We'll have ramps everywhere and everything else. And, and we'll certainly look at those traffic numbers and work on trying to, to make those signals as efficient as possible, put in the necessary turn lanes that we need to and, and everything else. I mean, you have that center turn lane, so yep. that's not the problem. It's yep. just sometimes when you're trying to make a turn in, you have all the bicycles testing. Yeah, well, We'll have, yeah, we'll have the, the signals timed such that, that, that we, we shut down those ped movements when we've got those, those dedicated left turns and those kind of things. And we just need to get the peds and bikes to behave as much as we try to get the cars to behave, which is challenging for all three users. And then um, on, the, on the design, it doesn't show it there, but I don't, and I don't want to assume that it, it's going back in, but you have the, the bulb out. Um, and right now we have that flashing crossing signal. Will that stay within the design or is that coming out because we've shortened it? Yeah, we would just relocate the, to, to, we think that crossing is important enough at Upham Street to keep that, that, that high visibility um, signal, that enhanced crossing there. So we would definitely put that back in. We'll just re relocate it in closer. Okay. And then um, last, well, I like, I like the low walls at Pierce. I think they're really nice. Um, but my, my only small comment is that it might also be good to, you know, indicate that they're in Wheat Ridge because sometimes I think people, you know, I mean, we're welcoming them to the Ridge at 38th, but we should be welcoming them to our city as well. And the, the, the low wall is big enough to be able to put. Well, if we do Mr. Starker's project and get signs around the perimeter of the city, then they'll, they'll already be here. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, that's a great comment. We could certainly work at getting our, our logo in there also. That's a great comment. Anybody else? Are we ready to accept the concept? We that's our challenge. A, we still have a few more things to listen to because I was looking forward to the, the green and the you had talked about in your intro the connections north and south of the bicycle walking Right, and just yeah. simply the way we had the agenda set up for this evening was to conclude on the conceptual streetscape design and oh. having the policy direction, and then we were going to move into those additional three items. Very good. Mr. Bond. So, well, I just, I, I withheld my comments for questions last time. I just want to, I, I want to say that I, I support the design. I think, I think that it's uh, a good, um, reflection of the discussion that we had after the phase one conceptual design and bringing together the the uh, different options that we had and so I'm, I'm happy with the kit of parts and how it's represented in in this plan um, I want to continue my support for the extension geographical extension of the of the streetscape and I'll, I'll just briefly say why I think it was just referenced that the corridor plan initially, Main Street really was extended to, to, to Marshall. And there's a reason for that. That's because it truly is the commercial, that is the extent of the commercial district. Beyond that to the east, it becomes residential. That's what the corridor plan saw. And I don't mean this with any disrespect, but it's somewhat arbitrary to stop at Pierce. Um, and I mean arbitrary from the sense of architecturally arbitrary because in fact there still is commercial there still is commercial architecture in a commercial district that's east of Pierce. I 
believe that we should continue as we move forward with this to uh, look at the area between Pierce and, and Marshall and continue to hold that in our, in our design. Um, I, I do believe that obviously once we, this has been referenced, but once we get into studying how this might, might play out in a construction um, aspect that different phasing options and all that can be implemented in order to kind of understand how, how that can be added. But from a design standpoint, I, I prefer to keep it in the conversation right now and honor the fact that uh, um, it truly is and was Main Street and we should keep, we should keep doing that. Uh, to some extent, to answer these questions personally, um, I, I do believe we should, we should move forward um, uh, with this. And, and part of it is what we've heard and tonight and, and, and many nights um, over the last couple of years. But um, I believe that we have a responsibility to um, maintain the momentum. That does not mean that we're not listening um, and we're not receiving input and all those things because I think we've done a good job and you guys have done a good job on that and I commend you for that. But it, we do have a responsibility because there's other people who are working very hard on this. We just heard it tonight. People who are planning a business improvement district, people who are planning on moving their businesses to Wheat Ridge, people who are planning on staying in Wheat Ridge and thriving on this street. And I think we have a responsibility to um, keep working just as they are working to make this street successful. So for that reason, I, I, I believe that we should um, um, continue to move forward and, and I support uh, proceeding with um, the elements that are um, uh, here as I suppose questions, um, understanding that there may be some more details that we need to talk about about what it means to proceed with survey and preliminary design, but I do, pr I do pr um, support proceeding with these next steps. Are you, yes, Mr. Urban? I guess w one question that I have is what is the outline of the different ways in which we would be able to afford this or to pay for this? How, how are we going to pay? Where are we going to get $9.3 million to pay for this? How are we going to pay? Well, our initial um, uh, thought was to, um, at what we're currently working on, as you know, is, is a ballot um, initiative question in November to ask for a sales tax increase that would potentially pay for this and many other projects in the city. Um, so that's our first choice. Um, second choice would be um, taking a look at uh, other revenue sources that are out there, um, using um, cutting back in other capital projects or general fund operating expenses, um, which probably wouldn't be enough to pay for the full thing. So that's why it's very important to, uh, um, to find a, a new revenue source or an increased revenue source. So both of the Cherry Creek North and Tennyson, Tennyson was approved by the voters in 2007 through a bond. Uh, issuance and then the Cherry Creek North was paid for through their uh, business district. Uh, business district. Yep. Um, so I would strongly encourage uh, public approval of this price tag through a ballot uh, language or through something else. Um, my other question is uh, based on the desire to put this on the ballot, um, how does that intersect with any possible? <laughs> business or citizen protest of the street width designation and how do those two uh, get sparsed out or, or how do we? Sure. Um, well, as you all know, there's a charter provision that uh, does um, require that city council um, designate um, uh, street width if there's a, a change in flow line. Um, and we do have that tentatively scheduled for July 14th um, to have that. It's a, a public hearing that's required to designate that, that street width. Um, and then there is a, a time frame that um, a couple different opportunities for the public to um, respond to that. Um, there can be a, a protest, um, which requires a certain amount of signatures, I believe. Um, and then city council can um, either accept that protest or override it with a, a super majority vote, I believe. Um, and then also the, if, if, they, if that's overridden, the public has another opportunity to get enough signatures to put it on the ballot. So um, that's why we're shooting for July 14th to designate the, um, the street width, because that would give us, if there is a protest and if, they, and if it does go, need to go to a ballot, that would give us the timing to put it on the November ballot. Um, if, if we wait any longer to, to do the street width designation, we would potentially have to do a special election, um, which we don't necessarily want to do because it just adds, adds cost to it. Um, so that, that's the process for um, the street width designation. And would that, 
have to be done on both phase one and phase two of the described Main Street subdistrict area, or is it one street with designation for both phase one and phase two? We, we would do it for um, this project, the Main Street project, from um, up um, to, to the Marshall Newland um, intersection. What's the phase one and phase two then? If, it, if, if the street with designation has to be uh, done within one year of starting construction, that would assume that we're starting construction on phase one and phase two at the same time. I'm not sure what you're talking about, phase one, phase two. Well, the, there's two different uh, sections of the plan, phase one and phase two. That was just based on the, the, the contract we had with IntelliKey. The phase one was Originally. to go through the alternatives, and then the phase two was to, was no, then no, no. to finish. No, no, no. I'm talking oh, about on the map itself. Right. That was, that was, just, that was just their construction contract. We haven't, we haven't really contemplated how we divide this up, depending on how much money is. We might be only able to go from Upham to just east of High Court with phase one construction, then from there to Pierce with the next round, and then from there to, to Marshall with the next round. That would take like $3 million a year, so that might be three phases of construction, or there might be an opportunity to get $9 million from somewhere, build the whole thing all at once. That's what I'm talking about, is that the street route designation has to happen within one year of starting construction on that section. So if there is three phases of construction, there would be three phases of that street. Potentially, yeah. Our intent right now on July 14th is to bring forward a public hearing resolution to do the street width designation for the whole stretch. Um, and then if that changes, if we don't get the funding to do the full thing, uh, if we have to do this in phases, um, we would potentially have to bring back street width designation in phases. Okay. Okay. Are we, uh, George, I believe you were going to make uh, the consensus. I think we need to break this down into parts that that uh, we need here, we have um, direction on the four points, which yeah, the, the first the direction, the first consensus we would like is is this is this the design um, that you're happy with? Um, can we move forward from this day forward with this design concept? Doesn't doesn't mean it's going to be funded or you have to or it's going to get done. It's just we need we need to um, move forward with a final design. And so is this is this what you are happy with? Yes. So this is thank you. So this Consensus is that we are happy. I'll, I'll say no that I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a consensus. Uh, do I have a majority here? I do. To move forward with the conceptual design. Okay. Can I ask you just a quick sure. question? Mr. Urban, uh, are there things about the design that, I mean, that you're concerned about? That, or is it just a general 38th Avenue? No, you're not. So, uh, so like, is there things that... Perhaps we can discuss tonight on the conceptual design that that is a reason why. No, I don't think it's a. It's not a blanket no on 38th Avenue, and it's never been that. The the design and primarily the price tag associated with it is ludicrous. 9.3 million dollars. You're out of your mind. There's no way that we can afford that. Not to mention if we took that same let's you know create it out of thin air again the 9.3 million dollars and help the businesses thrive on the curb in, we'd be a lot further down the road, literally, than just this tiny block area. That's my main concern, is that it, it doesn't encompass. So it's not necessarily the planning. conceptual design, it's more the, the dollars, it's, uh, the, it's the where the dollars are going. No, it's, it's the shortness of the design and, and the, the compactness of it, and that it's not addressing 38th Avenue overall for a $9.3 million price tag. I would expect for 9.3, we could go from Harlan to Wandsworth and be able to beautify the entire street versus just a, a small portion of it. So that's one element. Uh, yeah, sure, it looks pretty. Yeah, if we had an extra $9.3 million around, I... No, I, my intent isn't to put you on defense. Yeah. It's just more to get a better understanding of what your no is yeah, or right. why your no was. Right. My, my no is that we could use that money in a thousand different ways to both promote and encourage business in Wheat Ridge, and especially on 30th Avenue, we could still have a Main Street, and for half of that, I mean, Tennyson was two some million dollars. Yeah, so we, we are well off the mark, in my opinion, as far as uh, what where, where we're going with this, and that's my opinion. Okay, can we move on then to the item, the second item, which is the street width designation? Well, that's, um, we're moving forward with that. There's really no consensus needed. Um, consensus we're required to do that. Okay. So July 14th, there will be a, a resolution in public hearing um, on that process. Also, on that same evening, we'll provide an update on the metrics that we've been um, tracking 
um, and it's it, believe it or not this that'll be a two-year update at that point so we'll have a good two-year window of um, analysis on on sales tax generation uh, vehicle counts um, accidents um, vacancy rates and such everything we've been tracking so that will be July 14th um, the next step um, now that um, you're you're happy with it we have a final design is um, a next step moving forward would be to proceed with um, final engineering um, construction drawings um, and uh, we don't have funding for that um, there's some interesting timing implications with this also um, if, if, if your desire is to keep this moving forward um, you know, we don't, we, we'd have to have a supplemental budget appropriation. I think Mark may have an estimate on, on what those construction drawings and engineering are. Did you bring a number tonight? We, we have the numbers in the cost estimate, but, you know, do we go ahead and design the entire thing? Do we design just a piece of it? Do we I think the intent is to desire the whole thing? Okay. Design the whole thing. So, so yeah, so that, that number's in the neighborhood of, um, I had it in my head earlier, but I don't, I don't remember it now, but, but I can. What's the range? Let me do some quick math. Okay, so so we don't we don't have the money budgeted for that. It's it's going to be a significant amount of money. Money. Um, so we would like some discussion on that tonight. If if that's something you want to move forward with now, starting an RFP process to um, bring on um, to find a, a engineering firm to do this for us. As as we talked about before, we could potentially do some of it in house. Um, we don't necessarily have the in house expertise to do some of the specific. Um, landscape type design, um, final design that we may need on this. I think our in-house staff can do a lot of the fundamental um, street engineering and, and work, which might keep the cost down, but um, we're more than likely going to have to go out for an RFP um, process. So we could either start that now, um, and you'd have to appropriate the funding for that. Um, obviously, you may want to wait until you, you find out if you actually have money to construct the project, but that you'd have to wait till November for that, um, and that obviously is going to extend the, the process out a little bit. Then also, one, one last point on that, um, to get the street width designation done on July 14th in order to allow for uh, a ballot question in November, if it, if it comes to that, um, we, we got to be careful about that one year window that I, I believe Zach mentioned. Um, if we don't have construction drawings done and ready um, soon, we may not have construction started within that one year window. So there, there, there's a lot of timing issues here that we need to consider. Um, we could always push out the street width designation to a later date, but if there is a protest and it has to go to a ballot, that would require a special election. If we keep it on the July 14th date and there is a protest, um, we could put it, at least put it on the November ballot. But doing it July 14th, that means we have to start construction before July 14th of 2015. So, which means we need to have our construction drawings done um, sooner than later too to stay on that time frame. So there's a lot of timing implications to think about. The construction is just we have to start construction. We don't have to have a complete. Yeah, I think the, I think the charter says construction has to be started. So, go ahead, Mr. Pond. Well, I, my my thought and and perhaps my request for consensus is that I I, I think that uh, proceeding with trying to scope out what the survey and design work is in the way in order to understand what services can be self-performed versus versus contract uh, consult consulted out um, and develop an RFP that that we where we can actually get response to and actually then we'll have scope design scope and numbers based on an RFP I would would ask for a consensus to move forward on that. That doesn't, it costs staff time to be sure, but it doesn't cost us any money uh, in order to take that step. We're gonna have to take that step no matter what. Um, and we can certainly then look at what, what costs uh, this really is, as well as what, um, how it can be managed. Um, and so I would ask that we, that we do proceed with, with a kind of a scoping exercise and an RFP for survey and preliminary design. Get the costs until we have that engineer plan. We can kind of get a balance at this. Well, point. no, the co the cost of design though is what is the is what you get as a response to the RFP. Gotcha. Right. Yes. It, it is is, and yes. so that's I'm mean, that's kind of my you know what I would ask for. Patrick, does that cover what? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to go. You know, we've sort of 
Um, the number, by the way, is a million dollars. If 15% of your construction costs would be spent on engineering and design and survey and all those kind of things, it'd be a million bucks. That, that you know, construction the construction management is another. But that's another. part of the 9.7 yeah. total, right? So the, the construction management's another $600,000 over and above that. And, um, so, but again, so, it's not on top of the 9.7 No, that's part of that's the. That's part of the 9.7 estimate. 9.3, yeah, it's yeah, part 9 of the 9.3. So, so you know, it's a million bucks, but you know, that's certainly it's just a re very rough number. It's certainly, if we go out with an RFP, I think that's a great idea to go out with an RFP and just sort of see what's out there and figure out what's going on and figure out we need to have a conversation about how much we do in house. I'm kind of a control freak. Um, I want to do it all in house, but I'm not sure we can pull that off um, and still sleep. So. Um, do you think, do you, it, it would seem to me that we would need to start with an as-built survey? Yes, yeah, we've got a survey you, first, you, absolutely. Do you think you have the capacity in-house to do the as-built survey while we go out and, and, uh, and seek proposals for the, uh, for the engineering and design we need work? To, we need to look at, our, look at all of our stuff. We're spread pretty thin right now. We're surveying Tabor Street right now, but that's a pretty short little piece of, of road that we're doing. So we need, Scott and I need to have that conversation with everybody else and, and look at our manpower. So, you know, certainly I, th that is definitely the first step. And, um, you know, even if all we do is go out and get control established and do a few things that, that, that take a few days to do, we can certainly, I'm a really cheap guy too. I like to do things as inexpensively as possible. So we'll, we'll figure some of those things out, but we need to have that conversation um, before we commit to not sleeping. All right, do we need another consensus then? Or it sounds like staff's like. Yeah, do you, do you want to repeat your consensus survey? I'll try. It might change. Uh, no, <laughs> no. My my consensus would be that we that we uh, give staff direction to um, move forward with uh, um, uh, having internal discussions in order to 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 figure out scope of services in order to put out an RFP for survey and design, um, and that we then um, can discuss that when when uh, when that's done. Would we have allocated the dollars for that work prior to issuing the RFP? No, that wouldn't have to be done until the RFPs, until we receive proposals, we know what the exact dollar amount's going to be from the consultant or consultants, and we can figure all that stuff out, and then that's when the, the, the budget allocation would need to be done. So, I mean, wouldn't that need to be disclosed in the RFP ahead of time to let potential vendors know that there's been no money allocated for that, but yet we're still going forward with. No, we typically, we typically just, we, we, we generally, yeah, it, it depends on what you want to do. Because yeah, it, it, it's officially, you, you should have the money allocated before you put the RFP out. And um, is that based on our procurement standards, or is that just, because I would assume as a, as a vendor, as a designer, I would be. Yeah, it's it both. It's to put money or resources into putting together a million dollar proposal. Yeah, you, you don't want to just do this just for the sake of it. And I mean, vendors get upset if you're putting out RFPs and, and not being serious and don't have the monies allocated. So um, I, I, my recommendation is, is we do this internal work on the scoping of services and survey and bring it back t to you before we issue an RFP to make a decision on the, on the funding. And just just to clarify on the consensus, we want to do the entire street, the full up yes. under. Thanks. Right. Okay. Do I have a consensus on George's suggestion? Uh, all right. As amended by by Patrick. All right. We're good. Okay. Phase two or section two. Next. Okay. Um, so, just quickly, as a reminder, the next three items that we'll be going through this evening is the side street analysis. We'll talk a little bit about signage and wayfinding, and then also talk about the green. So, starting with side street analysis, um, as part of our second phase of our contract, the work that we completed for the city is looking at side streets. And why did we do that? It's, it's primarily for pedestrian access, getting people on foot to 38th Avenue. Um, so we basically reviewed the side streets that are coming into 38th Avenue from Upham over to Marshall. Uh, we looked at or focused our analysis primarily at um, 200 feet from the intersection with 38th. There were 13 total side streets reviewed. Eight of those were north of 38th and five south of 38th. 
So basically what we found in terms of existing conditions is generally there are three existing right-of-way conditions, a 40-foot right-of-way, a 50-foot right-of-way, and a 60-foot right-of-way. Two of the streets are at 60 feet, five streets are between 50 and 59 feet in terms of existing right-of-way, and six side streets are between 40 and 49 feet in terms of existing right-of-way. Some easements do exist, which may help um, allow a, a wider cross-section, um, and I'll show you preferred cross-sections as we move forward. So basically, the analysis resulted in identifying different priority areas. So the, the highest priority um, side streets, and so these are not a full intersection. Um, they were looked at individually from north of 38th and south of 38th, so keep that in mind as I'm walking through this. So for instance, you're seeing four stars here at the intersection with High Court and Pierce. Basically, we're saying those four side streets, so basically two intersections, but four side streets are identifying as a first phase priority. Um, for implementation of improvements to the pedestrian environment. The second phase um, you see on the four stars that just came up, um, moving from west to east, the first one would be Teller. The next street, it's covered up. <laughs> Okay, so Reed Street would be the next street um, in the second phase of priority. Moving further east, we're basically at Newland, both north of 38th and Newland, south of 38th. So that was in the second priority. Um, the third level of priority in terms of implementation of those improvements would be at uh, Quay and Otis Streets. And then the final stars coming up, the final three would be the remaining streets that are the um, fourth in terms of priority of improvements of those um, side streets. We also did identify, though, um, potentially improvements to Wadsworth Avenue, just making sure that you can get pedestrians across Wadsworth and getting them to 38th Avenue as another intersection to consider. So with that, we created three prototypical sections, one for each of the um, prototypical right-of-ways of what that might look like to make sure that we can incorporate a sidewalk. So within the 60-foot right-of-way, we're maintaining um, two lanes of travel. It's a residential street. All of these are primarily residential streets. Um, so we're maintaining two lanes of travel and on-street parking in that condition with a um, detached sidewalk, so meaning there's a an amenity zone, again, between the curb and the sidewalk. In this case, it primarily would probably just be turf and, and street trees. But at least you're getting that separation of the pedestrian from the moving cars or parked cars at this location. So this is simply the cross-section showing what that 60-foot right-of-way would look like in terms of reconstruction of those side streets, allowing improved pedestrian access to 38th Avenue. The next section is showing how that would be accommodated within a 50-foot right-of-way. So again, you have um, two travel lanes, one travel lane in each direction. You have on-street parking, but because we're 10 feet narrower than the 60-foot section, we're basically showing attached sidewalks, meaning the sidewalk is attached to the curb immediate to the street. Um, but with the 50-foot right-of-way, we are able to create wider sidewalks than a typical residential sidewalk. So here we're showing eight-foot walks um, attached with, with the on-street parking and the vehicular movement. And then finally, narrowing down to the 40-foot right-of-way, um, we're pretty constrained in this condition. So in this condition, we're showing the um, two lanes of, of travel within the street, um, as well as an attached sidewalk in this condition, and the attached sidewalk is seven feet in this condition. So again, all three of these sections are basically, the, the main purpose was to make sure that there's a sidewalk included on the streets. Um, I'm sure as you know, in many instances, there are no sidewalks and even no curb and gutter that exist um, as you turn the corner from 30th Avenue. So it's really providing that transition as people walk from the neighborhood, um, encouraging more people to walk up to 38th and to the activities that are happening on the revitalized um, corridor. So that was the side street analysis um, that was completed. Next, I'll talk a little bit about signage and wayfinding. So the goals here really are about providing wayfinding to Wheat Ridge overall as a community, um, providing wayfinding to Ridge at 38, 
um, providing wayfinding within the Ridget 38 Main Street subdistrict, and as well as marketing the Ridget 38 brand within the Main Street subdistrict. So when you look at signage and wayfinding, there's really there's different components to signage and wayfinding plans. There's programming the system and then designing the system. Um, and we actually did a little bit of the design back in our first phase contract, um, but we didn't really do any of the programming. So this phase really focused on the programming of the system. And within uh, programming a signage and wayfinding master plan, there's really three things to consider. Who are the user groups? Are they pedestrians? Are they bicyclists? Are they transit users? Are they people arriving by car? Are there visitors that are unfamiliar with the area? So different user groups to consider. Um, and that results in different sign typologies. Um, the different sign typologies might be, it's a larger si uh, sign with larger fonts based on people traveling 25 or 30 miles an hour or 35 miles an hour in a car versus somebody who's walking down the street as a pedestrian can read, si read signage as a different, uh, at a different level. So there's different typologies to consider. And then really all of that comes together in a location plan. So an actual plan that identifies where the different types of typologies should be placed um, within the study area. So just to walk through some of the different typologies that we looked at, there's obviously, um, there's really three different types of, of signs, um, gateway signs, informational signs, and directional signs. And so from the gateway community sign standpoint, many of those already exist within the city and there is a plan for addi additional citywide gateway signage um, that's currently in place within the city. But we didn't look just at the ridge at 38 or just at 38th Avenue when we went through this analysis. We actually got on the freeway and looked at the different routes into the community and is there appropriate signage that are actually directing people to get off the freeway and know that they're entering Wheat Ridge. Um, and so that would be the first component that you see here, that community level signage, where, whether it's the more um, traditional signs or the unique design that the city has. Um, and again, there is a master plan currently on the books for adding some of that additional gateway signage um, for the community. The next level would be um, sub-district gateway signage. So elements such as, I know these are a little difficult to see, but the the ridge at 38 banner, the over the street banner that's now in place, um, some of the signage that exists on the east end of 38th Avenue at Sheridan. So that's really uh, gateway signage from a sub-district standpoint. Um, then moving on to some informational signage, I spoke a little bit in the streetscape discussion about the idea of having a unique bus shelter, but simply having that informational signage um, designed into that unique bus shelter. So again, it's an opportunity to incorporate the Ridget 38 logo. It's an opportunity to incorporate um, perhaps a map, a location map of the district, a location for businesses, um, opportunities to have information on upcoming events, et cetera. So that would be one level of informational signage. And right now that's primarily proposed to be incorporated into the bus shelters. Then there's other types of information um, using technology, um, using QR readers, um, promoting the Ridge at 38th app, um, or having traditional pamphlets, and all of those elements are informational that can also be included into that potential kiosk design. And then there's obviously informational parking, or some people might say it's directional parking, um, directional signage rather to parking. Where are the parking reservoirs within the community? Um, and the idea there is to have one sort of a unified sign or symbol for parking within your Main Street environment, and that would be directing people to perhaps both public parking as well as uh, private parking reservoirs that would be off street. Um, some of that informational signage related to the parking would also be um, the regulatory components of parking, for instance, if there were two hour parking limits. So that type of signage would also be found on 38th Avenue. And the idea is uh, to try to have that parking signage be as unified um, for the entire district, both within the public realm or public parking lots, as well as private parking lots. And then um, directional signage. And, and there was some discussion on this with, the, with staff as we went through this process. But the question really is, what is the identity? What are the boundaries that we need to be using? 
because we can't finalize a location plan until everybody is in absolute, absolute agreement on different terminology. And right now, um, many of us have been using the Rigid 38 brand, but really what are the extents of that brand or what should the extents be of that brand? Should it be the entirety of 38th Avenue from Sheridan over to Wadsworth? Should it only be used for, say, within the Main Street subdistrict? Those are some of the questions that came up as we went through the process. Um, there's also um, sort of overlapping terms that are being used in, in different regulating documents in the city. Um, the comprehensive plan talks about a town center, um, but then some other documents also talk about a downtown. And so what is really that term, that brand, that you, the city, want to use um, for that area of the community. So obviously your downtown or town center is larger than just 38th Avenue. It's stretching up Wadsworth and that larger geographic area. Um, but all of that needs to be taken into consideration in terms of any final signage design, um, what term is being used, how it's placed, where it's placed, et cetera. And then simply the, um, the Main Street subdistrict versus the Sheridan subdistrict. You know, what are the, the common elements um, amongst the, the various districts along 38th. Um, there was a reference to the corridor plan in the discussion tonight. You know, we do have three sub-districts identified along 38th Avenue. From the east is the Sheridan sub-district, so basically from, um, is it Depew? I'm forgetting the boundary, basically about Depew, east to Sheridan, where um, there already is a, a unique streetscape in that particular area. It probably will um, always remain a little bit more vehicular-oriented. The central district from Depew over to Marshall is the residential subdistrict, and then the Main Street subdistrict is basically from um, Marshall Newland um, to the west, and, and really over to Wadsworth Boulevard. So there's a lot of terms that are being used currently, and the question is, how do we try to hone in on this so that you can move forward with detailed signage design and placement of signage to get people not only to Main Street, but eventually to your broader revitalizing um, town center or downtown district, um, a la the, the larger Wadsworth um, urban renewal areas. So uh, just some, some food for thought uh, for council this evening. And then just a little bit of, of detail. This is um, showing the, the concept drawing for those low walls at Pierce that I mentioned earlier. Again, it would be a pretty modest wall, about two feet high, that would simply have the Ridge at 38 uh, logo sandblasted into the wall. So again, our, our thinking in terms of the design of this wall is that it, um, that it stayed very simple, that they weren't very complicated walls. Um, they're primarily an identifier wall. Um, in these locations, there would be planting in front of them, but um, at the sort of at the the edges here, there are opportunities where it could also double as a seat wall. So it's just one idea of how to incorporate signage or branding um, into, in this specific condition, the Main Street subdistrict. So then moving on to the green. Um, again, the uh, one of the tasks um, that we um, began at the second phase or in our work in February was looking at the green, and it's basically the area of Wheat Ridge 5 through 8 Middle School, um, which is literally the green, the, um, the turf area in front of the school. And we know that the city and Wheat Ridge 2020 and other groups have been um, accommodating events and planning events um, in that space for the last couple of years. So we took a look at that in terms of what sort of perhaps modest improvements, um, or fairly modest, I would say, uh, converse to the, the streetscape improvements could be made to really make that space um, a focus point for the community. Um, and so I believe this plan is in your documents, and so I'll just walk through briefly um, the concept here for the green. So on the lower edge is 38th Avenue, um, the, where the pointer is now is High Court. Uh, this is the existing parking lot of the school, and this white outline that you see is the outline of the existing school building. So moving from 38th Avenue over to the existing plaza entry to the school, which we pretty much kept as is, I'll walk through some of the detail. So up on the, on the street edge, um, we do have a bus stop in this location, and so that's accommodated. Um, the, basically, the edge of the street is showing the future streetscape condition. 
we really wanted to play up the corner of High Court and 38th with some sort of entry feature. And so that would mean perhaps um, retaining the existing columns that exist there because they have some sort of uh, historical significance for the community, but perhaps modifying the cap for those columns and adding some sort of a more permanent tensile structure or structure over that to really show that that becomes a gateway or portal into the green. And that gateway or portal then can also be utilized um, as a way to uh, focus people that are paying for events or perhaps are drinking alcohol and have to stay within a confined area. So that would be one of the entry points um, to the green or to this festival space. So there's the plaza at the corner. Uh, where there would also be an opportunity for additional welcome information um, on the street. Then we wanted to separate the green a little bit from the activity on 38th. And so we retained the existing evergreen trees um, and deciduous trees that are in this area, um, especially the, the holiday tree. Um, it could be expanded to become holiday trees. Uh, but we retained those and basically created a buffer in terms of low-level um, native drought-tolerant plantings that would be in and around uh, those trees at the base level um, in conjunction with some um, crusher fines, which is basically very finely ground granite um, so that it could become walking paths around the edges so when people are gathering for the tree lighting ceremony, they're not trampling over the grass, but they have a place um, to stand for those events. And then there would be some low... Um, seat walls also integrated at the back edge or the north edge of that to separate that transition zone from the street to the true green. Um, moving along the, the eastern edge, we're retaining the existing sidewalk along the street. We're actually expanding the current angled sidewalk um, to allow for better access and movement of two-way traffic if, if tents were set up along both sides of that uh, or booths for events. Um, and I have a diagram that I can show. We're also pr um, proposing to expand the sidewalk along the edge of the parking lot for the same reason, so that you can get two-way traffic. Um, basically, people, as they move in events, um, say if there's four people side by side moving and some people are lingering in front of a, a tent on either side, the wider sidewalk um, allows for that movement and flexibility during events. So proposing widening the sidewalks in two locations and actually realigning uh, this angled one slightly. So then we're retaining basically a large portion of the green just as a green, as a very open, flexible space that can be programmed um, for different seasonal activities, um, the, the holiday festival, um, if there's a harvest festival in fall, if there's Fourth of July events, how it can be used for criteria, criterium, etc. Um, and then moving closer to the school, because we do have a grade change from the street down to the school plaza, we actually are creating a performance space that could be flexible. So because of the grade change, we're actually incorporating some low walls that could become seat walls into the grade. Um, and then that turns into basically a, a flexible plaza space that could be used for performance. Um, the entire space could be used for a large performance. Um, an actual stage could be set up in this area. Um, so we're maintaining, again, that pedestrian movement for people that are coming from all the way on 38th, coming through the parking lot um, to the school entrance, so that still becomes a, a walkway during events, but it gives an opportunity for a smaller stage to be set up on the sort of the back side or the school side um, for events, or it can be used as a larger performance space. So say one of the classes, um, there's you know, a dance class or something, and they can actually have performances in that space. Um, we're providing for some on-site permanent storage uh, up against the school, so things like that stage that may not be permanent um, could be put away or additional chairs um, or fencing, things like that, um, so that there could be permanent storage on-site. Um, and we also have an opportunity sort of the, at the V here where the two walks separate, um, terminating where the low walls are for an opportunity for public art. So I think that's a pretty good overview of the plan. The, the ice rink, uh, I'm hoping it's, yeah, I'll go back. Yes. So, th and the performance space or this flexible space was also identified um, to accommodate, I believe it was about a 60 person ice rink. So in winter, 
an ice rink could be set up temporarily. It still would allow for movement around the ice rink so students could get to and from the school, um, but that ice rink could be placed um, within the center of that performance space. And then these, uh, the next couple of slides are just design elements, some design inspiration images that we gathered um, as part of the design. So the idea is to have a combination of sort of the traditional green, that large green open space that can be utilized um, in different ways um, versus the modern green. So incorporating some of these low seat walls um, and seat wall areas both at that transition zone up by 38th as well as back by the performance space. The idea of incorporating public art that was mentioned, the idea of having um, some sort of signature gateway um, element up at 38th and then probably a more temporary um, non-permanent stage back by the school. Uh, the, this series of images just gives you an idea of how that landscape transition that I spoke of, having um, drought tolerant native plantings in and around the existing trees, um, allowing for people to walk and gather around the holiday tree for that event um, that would still be accommodated. And again, just looking at details. So again, paving um, details and the, the opportunity to incorporate additional art um, into the pavement. Um, for instance, one of the, the walks, if it's expanded or reconstructed, perhaps the students from the middle school actually create design panels in the pavement or in the sidewalk could, that could be incorporated into that design when it's constructed. And then the, on the bottom here just gives you a, a really quick idea of the section. So um, it's a little difficult to see in the key map here on the slide, but basically we're looking, the school building is in the, in the back here. This is that performance area. These are the low walls. Um, and the section continues through the green. So basically that's what you're looking at in the section. So from left to right, this is that stage area. This is the larger performance area that would be relatively flat. We would take up the grade with some low seat walls and then you would transition to the traditional green. I think that's... And then this is um, a diagram that we put together just to show how an event could lay out. So understanding um, tents and how they lay out and how vendors like to access their tents. And some vendors like to be able to um, drive their vehicle right up to the tent, which there may be opportunities for that along the edge in the school parking lot. Uh, but basically you can see where we're allowing for double-sided vendors along the existing sidewalk on High Court, um, which those would primarily be the food vendors because you're in the street. It creates a lot easier cleanup. You can just wash down the street after an event um, with the food and, and other elements um, that often are left behind by those types of booths. Uh, whereas more of the crafts and other types of, of vendors would be along the diagonal sidewalk as well as the western sidewalk that abuts the, um, the school parking lot. And there's also an opportunity on the back edge of this transition zone to have some additional um, uh, vendors located in that location. And I think the number we came up with is about 94, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, 94 um, total tents or vendors is what's illustrated in this particular diagram. Plus, plus one major beer tent. <laughs> and um, I guess one other thing to point out is, is the black dash line that you see here with the circles are identifying um, different scenarios of how this area could be fenced off and enclosed if you had fee entry or if, um, alcohol was being served and so forth. So again, you have the main gateway entrance and ticketing area at High Court. There probably would be a secondary one here. Um, this, this would really be primarily access for vendors loading and unloading in this area. There could potentially be an additional entry at this corner or not that could just be closed off and probably an additional one in this location. If you had larger events, say with the um, antique cars or something in the parking lot, you could do a fence um, within the parking lot or during other events, that fence could be placed more closely along the edge of the parking lot. So again, just different options in how you can use that space. So, any questions or thoughts on um, the three items that were just presented? Wow, that sounds like um, placemaking at, at its best. I mean, you've created how the, how the side streets can, can get into the areas, that, that there's sidewalks available, that it's complete, signs to get there, and, and uh, this wonderful green space to go to. So I'm pretty excited about it.
What are the questions or comments? On the on the green, um, does that sort of that plan sort of presupposes you 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 scrape the improvements that are there and start over? I mean, uh, not, would you? Not much totally. There. No, we're we're basically you again we're we're keeping. Um, Keeping all of the trees that exist up on 38th Avenue now are basically embellishing the, the landscape in that area. Um, we are reconstructing this angled pathway, would have to be anyway, because part of this would be getting regraded to accommodate the um, seat walls. So, the, the gray, so um, we haven't gotten to this level of detail. Again, this is conceptual level, but at some point, we're back here, we're meeting existing grades. Okay. But there's a larger portion of it that would be regraded to basically flatten it out um, to create these seat walls. Gotcha. And have you put a have you put a number to these? We have not. Okay. Other comments or questions, Mr. Fisher? Is there is there a sidewalk along the south side there, just on the other side of the foliage, the trees? Yes, so the, um, the gray that you see here would be the sidewalk that would be constructed as part of the streetscape design. So this is the sidewalk. I was talking about the vendor booths. Are there, is there a sidewalk on that side? We're, for, for these few yeah. booths, we're not showing. Um, we are showing, again, the, the crusher finds, sort of a, a walkable surface, but that would be back of, um, of these low seat walls. Um, in this particular location, we're not showing a permanent walk across that area. I, uh, I commend you for this design. I think it's great. I, I think I kind of need to be sold on what appears to be a barrier between the sidewalk on 38th and the green as, as opposed to incorporation of the green on the 38th. It looked like it's kind of a separation that you're designing there. It, well, I think it was a it was a fine line of of being able to have a transition zone, um, take advantage of the the trees that are in this existing location, but also providing a buffer when there's events. So, for instance, if there's a band playing, that uh, maybe you know some of the noise or activity on 38th isn't interfering with that, or vice versa. So, if somebody is saying um, at an outdoor cafe on 38th Avenue, but they're not participating in the event that this allows some uh, buffer again from some of the noise of the event. And we did, um, you know, it, it was very important and some of the feedback and input we received through the process was to really make this uh, grand entrance at High Court um, to make sure that that's known, that, hello, you have arrived. So I don't think the intent is to make it a very strong visual barrier. It's basically, it's taking the trees that are there and the cluster, as they're existing, uh, currently clustered, and the additional landscape that would be added would primarily be um, pretty low in nature. So it wouldn't be, say, higher than approximately three feet. Mr. Urban. The side street uh, discussion, how far into the, each of those streets does that uh, reconfiguration go? From the analysis standpoint, we looked um, back about 200 feet from the intersection. I think the um, if any of those go through um, further design and implementation, the exact length back from 38th would be probably different in each condition based on, on existing conditions and property, property ownership owners. and when it transitions to residential and things like that. Okay. And then as far as the green is concerned, what... Um, what steps have we taken to begin a discussion with the school district regarding this plot of land, or how does that play into all this? Because we can't do any of this until. Yeah, we, we've had pretty extensive discussions for a couple of years on. Uh, um, you may may or may not know right now we have a, a MOU or, inter or some type of intergovernmental agreement with them um, where they allow us to use the space for um, specific events. But maybe Ken can come up. I wasn't at the last couple of meetings with the school district, and he's had some um, really good discussions with them on this. Thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah, we sat down with uh, Tim Reed and uh, Brendan, I forget his last name, but one of his staff. So Tim Reed's the executive director of facilities management. 
he, she took over, he took over recently within the last year or so for Cheryl Human. if you, you knew that she was in that position for a number of years. So we had had conversations with Cheryl and uh, the, also her, or the, uh, who, I always forget his name, the- uh, Steve Bell. Steve Bell, and the, the chief Previous operations. superintendent too, we, when she was on board, we were having discussions with right. her too. So and, uh, if you'll recall from the, from the plan, we had actually proposed um, a parking structure and a retail building uh, on um, the whole site over to Upham. That was in the um, original. That was in the, the, in original, the original corridor, corridor plan. plan. So I think their reaction to this was uh, it looked a lot less uh, impactful than, uh, than that original plan. Uh, not that that original plan is off the table in any way, but we just think there's a really an opportunity from a programmatic perspective to be able to uh, you know, really better utilize this as an event space, which is what it's evolving into. Um, so we sat down about a month ago now, uh, Mark and Dina did a nice presentation, and I think did a really good um, job of kind of selling the, the opportunities that this can function as a really good space for the school. You know, the programmatic opportunities for the school as well, as well as the connection. I mean, I think they like being a part of 38th Avenue and what's happening, so that strong connection out to the street. Uh, so basically, I, I mean, I, we didn't get a, an approved contract, but uh, we got a very positive reaction from uh, from the school district, uh, from Tim Reed, in terms of the ability to do something like this, um, you know what what that would look like in terms of their capital uh, contribution, probably uh, little or, or nothing. It would be you know kind of our project, uh, but from a maintenance perspective, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, it seemed like they might be willing to continue to um, have the uh, responsibility for ongoing maintenance. Um, so uh, again, a, a real positive conversation. You know, kind of a, a unique thing about about this, the green project too. This could really be a separate project from, from the initial from the streetscape project. If if we couldn't do that right away, or if we have to do that in phases, this could be a separate phase. Um, if we found funding for this, it, it could be done. It could be done separate um, from the actual streetscape project. Um, don't have a number on it yet on what it costs, but um, that's <coughs> funds would have to be found too. So. This is for presentation purposes only. We don't need to make any decision, I take it, on this tonight? No, that's correct. Okay. And so the, what you just said there was, so any um, reconfiguration or touching anything on the green, that's totally separate and away from the costs within the design for 30th Avenue, correct? Correct, the costs are, yep. So this is sort of totally separate and different. Yep. Okay. Can we move forward then? Okay. Thank you, Ken. Do we have any other more questions? Nope. Good. Thanks, Dina. Nice job. Very nice job. Okay, we can move on to um, item number three, business development zone and S-STEP. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, some folks get out of here maybe a little bit. I know, right? So tonight we have in front of you a staff memo um, concerning our current, a couple of our um, economic development programs and tools. Uh, one is the, the S-STEP or the Enhanced Sales Tax Incentive Program and one, one is the Business Development Zone Program or BDZ. Um, and as, as you know, we've been, been using, utilizing these uh, more and more over the last few years. Um, and there's been some uh, direction from, from council to uh, bring this back and, and potentially look at um, maybe tightening them up a little bit and putting some more um, criteria or um, restrictions or regulations in place that would um, provide you, council, and staff um, more direction on, on um, how to uh, evaluate the proposals we get and, um, and uh, or applications we receive on both of these programs. Um, the current code does have um, some specific criteria in place, which is on page two of your memo. Um, this is straight from our code book, but um, it is fairly general. Uh, I'll just go through them real quick, but the criteria for both of them, for both programs, is that the amount of enhanced sales tax um, or use and use tax for the specifically for the BDZ program, um, which will reason, reasonably be anticipated to be derived from the city through the expanded or new tax generating business. Um, the public benefits from the project um, 
are provided by the applicant through Public Works Public Improvements and Additional Employment for City Residents, the amount of city expenditures which may be deferred by the city based upon public improvements to be completed by the applicant and the conformance of the applicant's property or project to the comprehensive plan. Um, so staff has been um, utilizing these criteria to um, evaluate each application. As you know, every application, every project is different and unique, so um, some flexibility is good. Then also in May of, of 2012, City Council approved a resolution which did establish the entire city as a business development zone. And that resolution also said that we would um, focus on certain um, niche and specialty retail and primary employers to provide um, BDZ um, incentives too. Um, we did a little bit of research um, across the country and locally on, on what other Colorado or what other municipalities um, uh, do um, when it comes to these programs, what type of criteria they've set up, and it's really all over the board. Um, specifically locally to, to Colorado, when you look at the SDEP program, um, every city's different. Um, they all have about, they all have the same language, which is basically, was written by one of our former attorneys um, for the city of Wheat Ridge, the SDEP program. Um, there's a handful of cities that have adopted this, that have the formal um, process or former, formal um, uh, code language in their code, um, but th the language is, is, is exactly the same in every city. The only thing that is different is some have included um, caps on the amount of, say, of share back that they will offer to a community so as low as or as a, to, a, to a business. Um, some communities are as low as 25 percent is all they'll give. Some will give up to 100 um, percent. Then they also have a, 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 a floor set in place, too, that the business must generate a certain amount. The enhancement of the business expansion or the new business must um, generate a minimum amount of, of sales tax before they, they can be considered for the program, and that ranges anywhere between five and 20000 um, BDZ is fairly unique to the city, um, the BDZ program, but there are similar economic development programs across the country which do the same thing, which basically um, abate different taxes and fees for projects. So, um, so we did provide some recommendations here. Um, in the city of Wheat Ridge, we don't have a, uh, a sales tax share um, cap right now. Um, we evaluate each, each differently. We do provide a spreadsheet. Um, in your packet that shows the current SDEP and, and BDZ um, agreements we have in place. Is, and you can see um, our share back is range, ranges anywhere between 25% and 100% based on the project for SDEP. So to maybe um, put a, a few more um, restrictions in place or a little more structure around this, we, we did provide a recommendation that um, we, we cap the amount of, of, of sales tax share back for the SDEP program at these different levels on page three. So, if, uh, and we also um, included a, a, a floor of $10,000. Currently our code says 5,000. Uh, a business must generate at least $5,000 of, of new incremental sales tax to be considered for the program. We were suggesting to bump that up to 10,000. Um, so it, it, anywhere from a, a range, if they're gonna generate 10 to, to 100, basically 100,000, they, their maximum share back would be 25%. Um, between 100 and 250,000, they could get up to 50%. 250 or higher, they could get up to 75%. I'm not recommending anybody gets 100% at this time. Um, and then for the BDZ program, again, which is a little different based on, um, we're gonna tie that, or a recommendation is to tie that to the amount of private investment that that project's gonna bring into the community. Um, right now, we don't have any restrictions or any criteria or thresholds currently in code. Our recommendation is that if a project is investing anywhere between 250 to 500,000 that they can get a 25% rebate of use taxes and fees. Um, 500,000 to a million, they get 50% and a million or higher, they could get up to 75% of, of um, rebate of those eligible city fees and charges and taxes which are, are defined in our, in our code. So that's a, a real quick summary of um, what we brought to you tonight. We also have um, several just um, non-significant um, code changes just to clean the code up a little bit that if you decide to, um, if you want us to bring these forward, we'll bring those, those non-substantive changes also in, in the form of a uh, 
revised ordinance. Um, but with that, we'll have any discussion. Steve, if you want to add anything to that. Okay, we have some recommendations here that we need to discuss. Um, do I have any comments? Mr. Urban? Um, with respect to the, the program as a whole, have we ever looked at the dollars that we've expended and how that relates to the end goal of the program to enhance sales tax, whether we have any numbers as to how successful or productive this incentive has been in actually generating additional sales tax dollars? Yeah, we, we, we have to track each one of these individually um, uh, as per, per their agreement. Um, can't share those individual tax return information with you tonight. We can, um, I, I didn't bring any um, numbers on, on in a more general sense either, but we do have those numbers. And, um, you know, I have examples I could probably speak to, but again, I don't want to necessarily give any business names. Um, but, you know, for the most part, these agreements are set up that the business has to perform Otherwise, they don't get anything, um, and I don't think we've had any um, application or agreement in place that I can um, remember that where not, they haven't performed. Um, except recently, we had the the Taste Home Cooking, cooking which has closed and had some changes, and I'm not sure if they're going to reopen or not. But that's the only one in in my tenure with the city where they haven't seen an, in, an increase. You know, I. Each one's different, Zach. Um, sure. You know, but every but, but everybody's they're not performing. They're not receiving any benefit either. Exactly. Yeah, they have to perform. Yep. Yep. Some have been very uh, it's a good example. This I won't give out any numbers, but the wheat recycler project, um, we had an agreement with them that was a span ten years. It, it, it was it wasn't an it, it's it wasn't an S step or a BDZ. It was it was an actual urban renewal project, but it's through TIF. But it's kind of an example of that one. Um, was um, the agreement laid it out for 10 years, but it was up to $250,000 that they could get back, and um, I think it expired in six years because they did so well that um, they got their. We were able to end that agreement after six years, and then and now the city's realizing all those um, increased incremental sales tax and property tax revenues. Additionally, we have a primary employer because one of the areas we tend to always look at retail, but we also look at primary employers. We had a primary employer that was relocating here, and they relocated because of the BDZ that we offered them. Um, almost 100 employees, all making uh, way above uh, the, me the median salary in Jefferson County. And that was Regalera. Regalera. Any additional? Mr. Starker. So it looks to me like that the scheme on this is to sort of disproportionately uh, recompense the big guys is that, is that so we're we're looking to give bigger bigger tax breaks and bigger um, in the in the step program and in the BDZ to the to the larger dollar users is that the philosophy yeah the philosophy is yeah the, the more investment that um, that we're, we're seeing from the private sector I think the more investment that the city may be willing to, to make commit to that um, so we're going to commit more to a but even in even in real dollars yeah. uh, you know you're you're a greater percentage on a bigger number yeah and as opposed to sort of the same percentage on a bigger or a smaller number yeah so because when you look at the enhanced sales tax in order to get to the 50 percent share you've got to have you know three and a half million dollars in sales sales a year so you're you're cutting out a huge portion of the smaller retailers, I guess, or smaller businesses that would be able to, to operate under that, under that scenario. Well, is that helpful? Is it helpful in, in getting those larger retailers or, or buildings or developers? I got two questions here. Mr. Pond had asked. Well, and I see where Mr. Stark was going with this. And but actually, it, it in some ways can also, I think, seemingly hurt the big guy. If you look at the, if you look at the breakdown, there's one that's got 100% rebate on a 2.5 million dollar investment, and actually, based on their sales tax, enhanced sales tax projections, they wouldn't under this program, they wouldn't get more than 25%. Am I reading that right? Because that's the way I look at it. I mean, it it actually. Mm -hmm. Can you? I'm sorry. Can you 
are, are you saying on the SDEP or the BDZ? Uh, well, I don't know. Oh, you're talking about? I'm talking about an STEP. You're talking about an actual agreement. An actual agreement. Yeah. Where there's a seven-year term with the four hundred thousand dollar cap, but the estimated increment. What, what's there? I mean, maybe I'm missing part of the math. Yeah. Yeah, that you're talking about the King Supers yep. S step. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, that we agreed to a hundred percent share back um, for seven years, uh, up to four hundred thousand. The, the, these numbers are a lot of these numbers are based on what they gave us, and again, I wasn't going to put what their actual right. sales tax is today. As part of the agreement, they estimated they were going to only their incremental was only going to be twenty seven thousand a year in sales tax to us. Okay. Um, I can tell you, it's higher than that. Right. So, but even um, even if it was double that, it still wouldn't break into the into the next threshold of this matrix. Even if it was triple that, it wouldn't break into the next threshold of this matrix. Am I? Am yeah, I, correct. Am they're, I they're, they're right now. So, right, so that, that, that's yeah. all. I mean, right now they're at twenty-five percent. Yeah, they would. They would have been under right. under this new scheme. And I know this has been the struggle of the conversation: is to how rigid can you be with this? Does it break down as a tool? But 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 I mean, Mr. Stark, you are correct. I mean, this 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 does benefit those businesses that are going to bring um, more potential property and sales tax to the city. Um, that's the way it's set up. Um, and you, you could do it reverse, I guess, but this is a discussion. Um, you could do it, you could make it flatter. Well, I guess, I, guess um, I, would, I would look at sort of flattening it out. Yeah. I mean, every business that comes to our, our, you know, a legitimate business that comes and brings employment and, and opportunity is yeah. a valuable business for us to have. Sure, yeah. Um, why wouldn't we tend to treat this equally with yeah. the people's dollars? I yeah. guess you know. I mean, I would probably look at fifty percent for five years, and and you know, something like that, so that you don't create this sort of disincentive for small business. Mm -hmm. I think there should be a role for you know for public incentive for business people who are small because our city. Yep. We don't have large fields that we're going to develop with, you know, 300,000 square feet of retail space. We've got, we've got 12 and 20,000 foot blocks of land that we're going to have smaller, um, smaller deals. Yeah. Well, and, and the reason, I think another reason we kind of addressed it this way is like, I mean, your current code is kind of written that way. Um, one of the more general uh, criteria that are set up is that, you know, the the criteria for the approval is the amount of sales tax generated. So um, we kind of just expanded that a little bit and put a put a matrix to it. But um, that can be that can be changed if if you want to go a different direction. Yeah, we'd have to go back and change that part of the code too because it's not going to be if you didn't want it be based on the amount. Um, I mean, because we also have in the code, you know, sort of niche and specialty retailers. And yeah. You know, arguably some of these, some of these that we've done deals with, and I know that we've over the years done a lot of different deals because the program yep. was moving in in a number of different directions. Yep. But you know, incentives are incentives for a reason. They're incentivizing what you want in your community, and you you can incentivize every business the same if you want, or you can you can pick out ones that you want to incentivize higher. So that's a philosophy that that we want your direction on. I guess on. if you use the if you use the criteria of niche retails and, yep. and the kind of business that we're looking at, I think that's that's incentivizing those yep. kind of businesses. Yeah. Now, if you say let's incentivize those, but we really want you to do, you know, 40 million a year in sales and you're yep. maybe not, you know, there yep. there a very, very limited number of niche retailers who are going to do 30 or 40 million in sales yeah, to, exactly. you know, uh, it just seems like that it would be more appropriate in our community to, to sort of level it out. And yep. Well, and honestly, I think, I think our the code, the way it's written today allows us that flexibility. Um, that's why it, I think it's taken us so long. And it's, it's been a, honestly a struggle for us to bring something back because um, but we've been asked to bring something back <laughs> that had some more criteria. And um, I, I think our current code allows us the flexibility. It's interesting, when we did some research, I went to the City of Westminster's website. They don't have anything on their website except call us, every project's unique. That's their, that's their policy at this point. Um, 
and I think we can go either way. We can keep the code as it is, and we can bring every project to you, and, and you base it on that unique project, or or you could you could even set a simple threshold, like you said, Mr. Starker, and you start at 50%, five years. If, if you bring something different, unique to us, we'll consider more. Um, it can be as simple as that, too. I think that's the reason that it's, like Patrick said, it's taken us two years to come to you, because we sit in the, we talk about it, that every, you're right, every project is unique. You know, your the restaurant, the Walrus 5560 brought forward was a unique niche restaurant that we're looking for. Plus, the we're, council keeps changing as well. Well, and it was the previous yeah. council that yeah, wanted this, a member of that. different councils, um, for sure. Ms. Davis. So, I know that, personally, I was one of the ones that kind of wanted some kind of table or prioritization grid. Um, after looking at it, I, I also agree with Mr. Starker in that... Um, you know, we're incentivizing the bigger guy, which probably the bigger guy has the bigger pockets uh, in many respects. Uh, so I, I can see the struggle here because again, we're not, um, you know, we don't have all the fields and we don't, you know, have space for um, a lot of big retail or big businesses to come in. And then if that is the case, do we really want to incentivize them any differently than we would a nice quaint restaurant or whatever it might be. I think some of my uh, requests for this and uncomfortableness of it, and I guess was, unfortunately, I think when we were doing it and when, when I felt squirmy, and sometimes when I still feel squirmy, is we were kind of attaching it to the person at the time and not necessarily the product or the development. Um, and I think that's where I felt uncomfortable, um, that it was more, I won't even hash out what it was, but you know, that it was a council person or if it was a, in, in our case, you know, even a current request, an ex council person, you know, and those kind of things, which is what made people feel, or at least me feel it's, it's not about the person. It's about whoever's willing to bring development and spend their dollars in our city. And so that's why sometimes it was squirmy because I think some of the decisions were kind of, well, okay, we'll give them 25%. We didn't really have any reasoning behind why we gave this person 25%, why we gave this person 100%, why we gave this person 50% tax rebate, why we gave this person none. You know, so in, in a way, I'm not sure that this step, you know, the the varies in the tables is probably ultimately what we want. But I would almost like to just see a flat, um, this is what we're given, this is what we're given everybody. After five years, if you want to come back to us and, you know, re have us reconsider or, I think there was some, there was somebody that, didn't we say after three years you could come, who was that? that we uh, Colorado Plus. Colorado Plus, that we, you know, that we I'm make sure that's a- part of their agreement. But it's not part of their agreement, but we talked about it. Yeah. It's a discussion. But yeah. it's not an agreement, so. But I th it was a discussion, at least. Yeah. But I, I think that was where I felt a little uncomfortable, was that it wasn't, there was a lot of variability, and unfortunately, some of it might have been driven by um, not hard facts like this, of this is how much you're spending. This, it was more, well, you know, that type of situation. So I see both sides of it um, because, again, I come from a world that you try to keep it as black and white and not put a lot of variability to get people in trouble. Uh, but I can see that the variability is needed. So that's... Are you suggesting we base it on criteria? You know, the more I look at it, no. I mean, the more I look at it, I, I just don't know that... Um, you know, say for instance, uh, Panera isn't as any more important than a Coles. But if, if we were just looking at this step, I'm gonna just pretend that those are my two businesses I'm picking from. Uh, but there would be definitely differences <laughs> in sales tax, but I think they're equally important. Kind of going to what Mr. Starker was saying. So I don't know, maybe we just do a flat and we just say to everybody, this is what we offer. You may, you may think today, Every business is going to be equally important, but there might be something that comes to you in the future. It's like, well, 
point. We really want that. I know, but then I exactly. guess I guess my question then you get the whole it's very subjective. Yeah, and, it uh, is, but And yeah. that's I guess I guess maybe in my world that's dangerous. Maybe in this yeah. world it's not, but it, you know, the subjective part is what yeah. makes me squeamy yeah. because I think that's what I've felt squeamy before in other decision-making processes. It was very subjective. The good news um, is you get to make the decision on this for your city. And uh, if you want to make it less subjective, we can do that. Or, Mr. Urban. In both programs, it's indicated that the negotiation of the agreements is what uh, soaks up the majority of staff time. Uh, are there specific points in the negotiation of these agreements that are soaking up more time than not? Are there different elements that would be beneficial to have laid out ahead of time and say that's just what we're offering? Or do we want to have some sort of I, mean, I guess when, when both programs are identified as that negotiation is the hardest part or the most time intensive, what elements of that negotiation soak up the most time? Or well, I, I, my point with that, that sentence was that I don't think you just want to leave this open for any, anybody. If they're just going to open a business and they can only guarantee $1,000 additional sales tax a year. I mean, if that's something council wants. We can do it for every business, but but they do take time to negotiate and to just to draft and go back and forth. It's 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 not necessarily they're difficult. It's just a process that we have to go through, um, and it's just a cost benefit. It's like, do you want us to spend that time on something that's maybe not going to generate as much for the city? I mean, again, that's your choice. If if you want to treat every business the same, that's fine. It's just you have to realize that it's going to take staff time to 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 process those applications yeah. well and that's where i think uh, to, to hold up yeah. to to that point knowing that staff time is at a certain amount yeah and if we can come up with a like christy says some kind of floor yeah. that says on average these agreements take 50 hours so anything below this we just we won't be able to break even on therefore yeah. we shouldn't spend money but i think that that would be a pretty low floor that we're dealing with well, on the floor we set was 10,000 10, for sales tax and 250,000 for investment. That's fair. We can change them. We can do analysis if you want to connect that with Mr. staff Sturman time. Next. Okay. Well, Mr. I've already spoken. All right, Mr. Fitzgerald. I'm just going to say, you know, I really understand the need for objectiveness, um, especially in the legal realm. You know, if somebody's saying, well, you did this for this guy, but you only did that for me. However, I, I think we just have to trust the staff to negotiate because it is true that some businesses are more important to us than others. And it's true that we can't really anticipate who they are. So um, I, I really don't think we should put anything different in code here, do anything different, unless we just want to increase the minimum. Uh, yeah, I, that's where I am. I, you know, I think we want objectiveness, but we can't have it. Mr. Starker. I think you need to, you need to really kind of look at these, at the two programs differently. The, the, the S-STEP program is a sales tax uh, sharing thing. The, the BDZ is a capital investment in a piece of real estate. I, I think they I think they conceive somewhat differently. I think on the on the BDZ, if you talk about just the BDZ, it seems to me like you might want to have a different tiered structure because you're looking for someone to come in and put capital dollars into real assets that are going to be in your community mm -hmm. for a longer time. If you put if you put a small amount of money in, uh, you either don't don't create the kind of improvements or you don't have the same uh, impact on the public sphere as you do and you come in and you put more more money more of your capital resources in there so I think it makes sense to sort of share those back disproportionately if you will on the sales tax um, you know a lot of that is sort of driven by uh, good sales tax are, are you know generators are good are good businesses that people want to come to 
and they spend money there and they generate tax revenue. Well, in a way, it's the city incentivizing businesses to come in and, and work and, and uh, you know, create, invest their capital. And for that, the city is going to get a, a share of those, those revenues. And, and whether you're, you know, so to me, that's more of an equal, you know, more of an equal thing so that the, so that the business that's going to come in and invest, you know, multi-millions of dollars is going to create lots more sales tax revenue, but that proportionally is the same scale as the smaller business that's coming in and, and brings more limited dollars to it, but still brings a, a, a jobs and, and economic opportunity, and I don't think that those should sort of be uneven. I guess I, so in that respect, I, you know, I would, I would see that, and I think, you know, in terms of the, maybe the way to look at it would be to sort of set a target out there, you know, I, I think maybe the, you know, the, and I think we need minimums also, because I think at some point, you know, there, there are some, there are some uh, business investments that are made are sort of too small to sort of be, really get into it. Um, but so I think sort of the BDZ thing is probably okay the way you've got it. I mean, quite frankly, on the S-step thing, I would say, well, why don't you share 50 percent, use five years as a term, because that gives you an idea of how far, you know, what you can sort of look at as a business going forward. Uh, you know, you may not pay off your deal and, you know, or, or really be on your feet in three years, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And, and the other thing about that is that in the sales tax, you don't get it until you've paid it into the city. You know, you've got to have generated, you had business running, customers coming in, making, you know, collecting sales tax and remitting that for a year before you ever, or, or you know, you ever get to the share back. Yep. So if you go out of business in nine months, you don't get to the share back. Mr. Urban. Um, <clears throat> to that point, I think it might be beneficial to have for both programs a program goal that set that the city of Wheat Ridge wants to raise X number of sales tax dollars at above and beyond where we're at today as a program goal for the STIP and the same thing for business development. We want X dollars in business development done within the city and then as applications come in we can see how that fits into our strategic plan for these particular programs so that we're not, um, we are sort of behold to a, to a goal as someone comes in so well let's check our goal and see how that fits into it. We have a goal to raise X amount in sales tax revenue, or we have a goal to improve or invest in our business development zone program in some way to set those goals, to use that as a way to then look at the projects in context of those program goals. How much increase do we want? And would, then- Would you suggest we, once those goals are met, we don't offer SDEP and BDC anymore? I, or? I would think the goals would be stretched and significant. Um, I, I don't know what those goals would be, but I yeah. think that it, it would put it in, in a proper context so that we're, what are we doing? We're, we're trying to increase sales tax. Well, to what? Yeah. And then it, it helps us kind of fit the different businesses into that puzzle for that year or for, because if we set a stretch goal and we meet that, then no, we don't necessarily need it unless, of course, something else comes in and we can go, doesn't keep us from going above and beyond that goal. I don't know. Mr. Starker. I would, I would look at it somewhat, uh, somewhat differently. Instead of setting a, a tax revenue goal, set um, really sort of look at the kind of businesses and, the, and the, the kind of merchants that you're bringing into the city. Rather than the, rather than the dollars being the goal, the, the goal is really to bring variety or the niche market is or, or think, you know, incentivize the kind of retailers and businesses that you that you believe your community wants rather than sort of to make it a, why you know. couldn't you have both you can't have both and I mean you you would have both but I would probably put more weight on the on the criteria of is this is this a business proposition that we want to have in our city because I think that helps with the negotiation aspect of it that you have something you're going back to it's not necessarily a criteria like we're talking about here it's more these are what our economic development goals are, and you can apply. The increased sales tax. I, I don't know. If it's, it's, I think it would be hard to put a cap on it. I mean, we're, we're always, our goal is always to increase sales tax, honestly, I think. Sure, but right? but it, it, it gives some kind of backdrop yeah. to frame the applications and, yeah. and gives you a better negotiating position yeah. because then you can say, 
well, that doesn't really fit into our strategic plan for economic development or, or what have you. Well, we somewhat have that currently in the code that, you know, again, those four criteria, cr criterion that, you know, the amount of enhanced sales tax that this business is, is going to reasonably be anticipated to, to be derived. So, again, again, that's, I guess that's why we kind of put this, this, this tiered structure together because that's, that's one of our current criterions is to base it on look at how much sales tax is this going to gener generate to our community. Um, okay, what you know. we've heard so far that I heard anything solid was that we <clears throat> raised the minimum. Is, that's what I heard. And not to do much difference with the, with the rest of it. But, it, but do I have a, a, con a concession a, into another direction? Ms. Davis. So I do like Bud's suggestion as far as with the development and the private investment that we keep that a tiered. Um, because I do think it does have a value, you know, and they're going to have more fees and as the more they spend. So I would say that maybe the recommended changes to the BDZ code, um, that okay. section two looks okay. Okay. If everyone else would agree. Same minimum, you okay with the minimum and the percentages? Right. So S step, we do nothing except raise the minimum. Well, uh, maybe now. put. And BDZ as a different. Keep it tiered. Keep it tiered. Right. So. I don't think we've decided as that. Maybe BDZ is, I think the consensus is, is going as presented, right? Do, do we want to get consensus on that? One and two. Wait a minute. G give me that one again. The, I, think, I think what I'm hearing is that there's a consensus to go with the recommendation for the BDZ. Which is number two. Which, uh, number well, two. It's, it's the it's second one section, two. one and two. Second section. Three. It's to include a $250,000 minimum level of private investment for the yes. project to be eligible for the incentive, okay. um, and then, then, the, then at those tier those tiers. Okay. Do you want to add to that? We've got a consensus floating out here. You want to? I think they're. Oh, you're, you're voting yes. Okay. okay. No, I think that's All right. It. Sounds like we've got a consensus on that. All so right. then, I, I propose for S step, we raise the minimum. Uh, as proposed, and then just leave the rest of it alone. I think we should do something different. I, I would propose that we raise the minimum to what the ten thousand dollars, in, in, and then, and then go fifty percent for five years as sort of the target. A blanket fifty percent for all categories. Yeah, that's sort of the, yeah. And would that All categories be, in our niche, niche and specialty yeah, retail. Yeah, and, and you know that's, under the May Fourteenth resolution. Yeah, and that's not drafted into code. Just so you realize that that was done by a resolution. So that's that's not actually in code. But we could still stick to those. Well, I think that would be for sort of guidance. So yeah. Have the ability to kind of target. We could put those in code if you want, as part of the ordinance, or leave them in a resolution where they're just kind of more of a staff direction, administrative. Mr. Pond. Yeah, just to that point, which is not what I was going to say, but I would say leave it where it's at um, because we can continue to come back and discuss that as things and move forward, and that gives us flexibility. However, I do agree that, yeah, we, we've, we've already said that here are some areas that, yeah, yeah, this is how we're trying to incentivize, so let's keep those as, let's keep those as, as uh, guidelines, a absolutely. The, um, I, I, I agree with the moving up to the 10,000. Um, and I'm, I'd say I'm uh, partially there with, with Mr. Starker's recommendation for 50% over five years, but I'm not all the way there. And the reason is, is that, that I, 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 and you mentioned like it as a baseline or something like that. And I think that's, I think that I like that as something that it says, listen, out of the gate, you know, this is, we're looking at these type of businesses. And these are the this is the baseline term that we're that you know that we're interested in, but I wonder, and this goes back to the previous conversation about flexibility with the tool, whether or not there can be additional flexibility built in so that it, we're not like stuck necessarily to that. It could be less than that, and perhaps there's a way, uh, perhaps there's a way for it to to go up to maybe 75, but you know, but that's a negotiated piece so that you're, you're basically saying, listen, baseline is you got to bring in more than 10 10 per year. And we will be, you know, we will be looking at, at what, what we try to do is, you know, look at a term that's, you know, 50% over, over five years. Up to 50%. Up, 
Well, and I'm and I'm even saying, well, you know, hold on, that we may, if you needed for negotiation purposes, for you know, for some wiggle room, how, how do we account for that? You know, instead of capping it at fifty, how would you? How would you maybe? You know, maybe there's particular deals are different. All deals are different. So Jones. do you have yeah. some flexibility? How about how about how about how about, how about this? That um, <laughs> maybe maybe uh, the code says that any. You know, it's negotiated. It doesn't have to be 50%. If they ask for less or we think they should be less, it's like anything up to 50% up to five years, it's at staff's discretion. Yeah, up to. Yep. That's and then a if, they, if they need more, it has to go to council. I'm okay with that. I was just going to suggest a permissible negotiation range. But it's just a very... Well, well, it sounds like if I was to recap what you just said, the permissible range would be from zero to 50. And then, you know, and we might say you know we're it, the, beyond that it, it it takes another action um it takes an, it has to come to this this body for consideration so for, well, this one is changing a lot go ahead okay so can i ask for a point of clarification because i'm just i just want to be clear i i think the last we have is that we're going to okay the but not on that i'm looking oh, at our little <laughs> grid and uh I'm looking at our little grid and that we have that we've already done and I'm going to ask a question and it's nothing personal against anyone um, but if we go off of our our little niche mar niche retail and yada yada then just asking a question then would King Supers have fallen under that Ret uh, primary employer yeah. Well, no, primary employer. That would not related. have fallen under our two, I mean, that's, I guess, you know, I'm just, like, to be real, if, if you really want to look at A and B, uh, mm, not so sure. And so that's well, to just. Be, to be clear, staff recommended less. I know, well, yeah, I mean, Council we definitely changed gave it. the farm And we that. recommended more on the 29th Avenue restaurant board. Yeah, we definitely, yeah. You know, so I'm just, you know, just as a point of discussion, <laughs> it's interesting because just if be I clear. looked at what we just talked about, niche retail, outdoorsy, la da la da da I don't know that King Supers would have possibly fallen under that. I don't know. That's, I guess, just my little point of discussion. I, you know, again, it's nothing personal. I'm just trying to think, okay, as we move forward, what does that mean? Mr. Pond. I, I mean, I think it's a valid point. Uh, although, just, just like has already been stated, every one of these negotiations is going to be different for different reasons. I, let, so I could paint the scenario that, yes, we're saying that, please, let, let's try to stick to this list, and we'll come back to this list if we, have to, if we, if we decide we want to change this. But you never know who's going to walk in the door. So someone walks in the door who's perhaps not on this list. You still want staff to have a conversation, I think, and um, and and obviously then uh, bring it bring it back. In that case, I would assume that since we've kind of said again, let, it should be on this list. If someone in the future came came like that, that what I would expect, I, I suppose, is then is that for a conversation to take place, and then ultimately for 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 the for staff to come back to us and say hey someone walked in the door it doesn't quite fit this but here's why we want to talk to you about it or something like that and i think that's i think it's reasonable to allow for that and i'll, I'll, I'll yeah no i agree are you done I, yeah i, I didn't mean to interrupt no no i was just going to kind of make a point too on christie's i mean this just kind of goes this brings it to the real world when we looked at king supers it, you know it may not fit in the niche re, um employer especially retail but you know, they're a significant sales tax generator for the community, you know, over half a million or more. And they were under a lot of pressure. They were putting us under a lot of pressure. It's like, we're not going to remodel unless we get this much. Um, and I think they were telling the truth because now they're doing a remodel at the King Supers in Youngfield and they didn't ask for any money. This was a different store that they, they, their numbers were different at the store. They needed, they needed more incentives. So I know we want to try to treat businesses the same, but when you're actually in the real world, when you're looking at it, it's like there's a risk that they're potentially going to leave or move or quit or close. We're going to lose half a million dollars. So Yeah, I'm, not, I'm definitely not, not saying it's yeah. not something I would have done, and it's not personal. But really, when you looked at the description, and that King Supers is a lot nicer than it used to be. So, yeah, and, 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 and I will shop there now. 
but um, but it, it just you know goes into I mean we could put a lot of we could put a lot of people in that it could be like in that that it's instance I also see they have a long-standing history with the city and et cetera, et cetera, and they have that but what if it's you know a brand new King Supers coming in yeah. or you know whatever it might be you know so I was just yeah, no, I, I agree. Here. That just, I think it just shows you the complexity of every, every deal that there are a little different. And yeah, and maybe we say, okay, you're not niche, made. but we'll give you 25%, not 50 or something. But if you read the code, it doesn't say these are the only ones that we will offer the program to. It's offered citywide, but it says we should target our areas in this. So it didn't say someone, a large sales tax producer already existing that was a grocery store is not eligible. Yeah, I mean, I think the already existing also helps you know, that they were already here. As we've been saying for two years, everyone who walks through our door is different. That's why it's been so difficult to come yeah. before you with, here is how the program operates. So, so back to the enhanced Yeah, let's, let's, tax, let's I, get back to I this. What I'm hearing is okay. Uh, yeah, and, and if I can add a two cents, which I get to do once in a while, uh, I think that we do need, yeah, two, three cents, whatever, <laughs> never mind. Um, I think that the variety that we want to have, I, I firmly believe this city will be roaring at some point. And we're going to be, want to have the to, to have that variety, that choice. So zero to fifty percent would be a to me, a, you know, and as well as with strong recommendations from staff, they're in there negotiating. They know what has to be done, as well as increasing the minimum. And that was um, so. Do I have a consensus on that? And who is going to give me that? Well, what I've heard so far is to increase the minimum to 10, and then I, I believe Mr. Right. Starker said Zero. up to 50, right. or 50, not maybe not, to, just, okay. Pardon me. As a baseline, 50% yeah. five years, and you sort of go up or down from there based on the quality of the deal. Yeah. And it, are, do you want to, I guess this for clarity, do we want the up movement from 50 to you know to to come to come through us so we're not well, putting it we're not putting a cap on it or anything we're just saying baseline 550 how do, we, how do we do it now do all of these deals come to council they've yes. all come to council so yes. what you're saying is it's is it, there a and i think they probably still would um because the mayor probably has to sign off on them because it's an agreement um financial agreement that's in the code that's required but we could still at least at least the the businesses would, would know that they can get a deal probably approved at a certain level with staff, but if it's going to be bigger, it's got to go to council. So we'd still bring them all to you for approval, but maybe if they're under a certain level, it's more of a well, formality. You know, and, and, and listening to our discussion on the tape of September 10th of 2012, when we last really discussed this issue, um, we, we thought that it should come to a study session. I mean, that was a big part of the conversation. Why, 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 were, we, why were we cutting deals on the dais? We should have this at a study session. Um, which I think is appropriate. I, you know, I, but I think what you do is you is you give the staff, you give them a bench line of where to shoot for, and then have staff look at the look at the who who, who it is, the, the resources and what the business is, and bring that to bring that to a study session, and and let's discuss it, and then you know, and then weigh the merits. I still I still think though, I mean, if you're going to give us if you if you want us to negotiate anywhere between zero and fifty. I mean, you still got to have language that says, I mean, you don't just say our baseline's 50 because, I mean, they're automatic. Every tenant's going to, or every applicant's going to say, well, I want 50, right? I mean, shouldn't you, shouldn't you have a range that's like up to 50% that, that we'll, we'll negotiate with? Anything above has got to go to council for, or is that where you're going? I'm not sure if that's where you're going. I think the, uh, the, there's a, there's two different things. One is you're negotiating the percentage, and one is you're signing off on the deal overall. And I think it's appropriate to have each deal come to council to be a, vetted and approved or disapproved based on council's discussion. But I think as it relates to the initial part of that discussion, staff can uh, negotiate up to 50% by themselves. And then if a deal wants to come before us at greater than 50%, that part of the deal is left to council's approval as a part of the approval of the overall package. But doesn't like that still. It sounds really complicated to me. I which which pieces logistically? What? So, so you're gonna you're gonna make the deal at zero to fifty percent, and then. 
sort of bring it to council or bring it to council and input, but you don't get too much input on it? Or Well, we could go either way. I don't want a situation where staff is, uh, each retailer in the city is coming in and saying, oh, I want my 50% back mm -hmm. without, I want council to be able to approve these deals or disapprove them based on their merits. But the council is not going to then nitpick 50 and below. We're going to agree that if it's 50 and below, we're not going to be dealing with the percentage of it. That that part of the deal has already been struck. Well, I. We uh, have nitpicked 50 I, and below. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Well, that's what we're trying to get get away from, though, right? Yeah, so. No nitpicking. Well, I mean, so looking at it almost like a zoning, you know, in a zoning situation, but I would ask, like, can you, can we be comfortable? Because I, this is where we're talking about it. It's like we're basically saying, in this range, it's administrative, period. Yeah. Staff is going to do it. It's administrative. Y yes, it's going to come to us, but at that level, it is, it's administrative. It's, it's, it is approved. I mean, it's basically approved, just like a zoning, yeah. uh, an administrative zoning issue. Above this, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not. Staff can't seal the deal until it comes to us and you know so if it's 51 or 75 or whatever you know if that's where you need to be well then it has to come here and it has to be dealt with in this way I think that's okay I, that's okay so so but that gives so that does change where they're at right now because it's basically someone comes in the door and says I want 49 percent over five years and I meet the and I'm, I'm at ten thousand and one dollars and boom it's done deal if you want it to be I mean that's what that's that's what, that's what, the, that's, the, that's what, yes, that's hey, what we're Hey, wait a minute, about. everybody's talking at once, and, we, and that'll really confuse her as well as the discussion. So uh, let me, George, were you finished? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Urban. I think what's administrative about it is related to the percentage that's being discussed, not the agreement overall cannot be administrative. So the, the, the deal itself has to be approved by city council irrespective of whatever percentage use, is used. In the instance where that percentage is above 50%, then we as council want to look at that deal to determine is it viable at whatever percentage they want above 50. Anything below 50, we agree that that would be a good deal. Really, the only deal terms are in the in the agreement are, yeah, the, the share back amount and the, the years, really. I mean, there's nothing else in the agreement to approve necessarily substantially. Subs that's substantive. Um, what would you prefer then? Well, I, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing many different things, but I'm, I, let me run down a couple options. We could do, we could do something administratively at, at a certain level, just totally administratively, nothing comes to council. I'm not 100% I'm not, not suggesting that, but you know, and it could be 50% and less and no more than five years. Let's, let's take a stretch and say those are done administratively. Talking about open for business, that would be open for business. It doesn't mean we, we approve everything at 50%, but we'd follow these criteria that are, are currently in the code and, and maybe it's only 25% for three years or um, anything above 50% or more than five years has to come to count and or more than five years has to come to council for approval. Or I, you could set that differently. It could be 25% is administratively. Anything above 25% comes to council. You, you could say, you know, a, a deal where you can uh, take what the staff has to offer. If you don't take that offer, then if it goes to city council, it could be less or it could be even more. You don't know. <laughs> so it, it's sort of. This, this no guarantees. The, it's, take the plea, sir. Yeah, it's, plea. It's, a, it's similar to a plea deal. You either take this deal or. You can go to council and, and take your chances. You may or may not get that same deal. I don't know. Wow, Mr. Pond. Well, I I, I, I kind of feel I, I'm not. I think there is a range where administratively it would be interesting to to think about because it would basically create more flexibility for staff and a better in a better yeah streamline and also I think a better kind of. Um, uh, understanding of the businesses when they come in, what they can negotiate for, and that it's going to be, you know, they can do business in a, in a more clean way, perhaps. So I am kind of interested in that. If you don't do that, I'm not sure we should mess around too much with, with it other than just say it's $10,000 uh, minimum on the, on the increment, and 
The rest is negotiable. The rest is negotiable, and it's all going to come through council. Because because otherwise, I think everything else is speculative. Whether you say, you know, you could say five years and and 50%, and that's all you're doing it is just kind of saying it as, well, this is kind of the range we're in. Otherwise, so, I mean, it'd be stronger in my mind. It, you know, so in one sense, you just say, here's our minimum. It's all negotiable. It's all going to come to council. Or you say, hey, at this level, it can be done administratively, and uh, beyond that, it's going to come to council. Well, the, the other consideration I have is what if we gave staff a sort of a supposed pot of money that can be used on an annual basis administratively that you can eat into that on an annual basis up to that 50% on each deal until once you've reached that, then it comes to council. So you're not necessarily because you could see a situation where we set something up administratively, then every business who brings in more than $10,000 annually comes in and applies, and they each get 50%, and then well, what's to stop a horde of businesses coming in and applying if it's just simple administrative and staff has to approve it if it's at X? Well, we or, don't have to approve it. It's well, still, we would st staff could still say no. Well, but, but it's administrative, so... We could still say no administratively. Mr. Fitzgerald? Yeah. I'm certainly beginning to see why it took two years for you to bring this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there's just really no good models out there to bring to Right. So after listening to all this, uh, you know, there's a lot of merit to all this discussion. But I want to go back to my original proposal that uh, we up the minimum and make the rest negotiable, and then it comes to council for approval. Do we have a consensus, maybe, or more discussion? Ms. Langworthy? No, I think that's what people have What we've found in the past is that, like you said, there's no set in stone way of doing this. Um, King Supers was a unique employer. We couldn't lose them. I mean, we just couldn't lose them. Um, and the next business may not be that kind of we can't lose business. It's not. I mean, um, Taste of Home Cooking is its kind of like that opposite end of the spectrum. They came in. They didn't want to do that. They really didn't do the forms, didn't do the forms, didn't do the forms until they were almost open, even. I mean, they were way at the end of it. Um, and they did do work. They did do improvement. But now they're gone. Um, do we want to? I mean, I, I just as soon have these discussions so at study sessions, not on dioceses. I mean, that would be my only consensus, that, that we raise the floor and, and do this at a study session and not try to figure it out on the dais, because it hasn't worked for us on the dais. Mr. Starker. So in that, so the deal is sort of from zero to 100% and one year to 40 years? Is that kind of where the range is? <laughs> uh, <laughs> But you rely on staff to negotiate that. I, you know, right. you have a city manager here who's fiscally responsible for budgeting, and so he's usually the one that kind of holds the reins on me. Or you could still cap. You could cap it no more than ten years, or no more than seventy-five percent, and then everything comes to council. You could still cap some stuff. Does that? You could, but again, you know, or if you want to be one hundred percent flexible, you don't. You just it's negotiable. Right. But then, then you run into situations where everything may not be black and white. Yeah. I don't know. I. Well, I guess I guess what I what I was sort of thinking is that you would put fifty percent five years as sort of the middle baseline where you looked at deals. Some deals don't, you know, depending upon the quality of the deal and the quality of the, of the, of the merchant that you're trying to incentivize, so maybe it's 40% maybe it's for five years, or, you know, or maybe it's 60% for three years or something like that. You know, there may be, there may be something, and I don't know, you'd, you'd need to go back, and we don't have a long track record of different kinds of businesses. There may be some businesses that, that need, you know, sort of a longer payout at a, at a less rate or some need a, you know, you're looking really at the incremental sales tax increase. So some, some you know, if you take West 29th, there was zero basis of sales tax there. So now it's 100% more sales tax than what had been generated. You look at King Supers, they've got a huge, they've got a huge gap. They've got to, they've got to pay all the taxes that they 
elected last year, and then they've got a they've got an increment above that. So you know it's it's really like I mean I, I guess I was just sort of looking at if you had to give guidance or something that would be sort of a guidance for staff to go out and make the deal, bring the deal to the study session so we can discuss it and then take it to the dais and, and make the deal. I think that, yeah, that's, that'd be better at administrative guideline that this is how we negotiate internally, but I don't know if you'd want to put that in your okay. unless, unless you have a range, because if you're saying 50%, we're gonna shoot for 50% in five years, Right. The difficult you've got, you've got you've got code language and then you've got guidelines. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we have a guidelines for niche specialty retailers. That's not in the code, so maybe we don't need it in the code. Maybe maybe we just leave the numbers out, and you develop a, a parallel, Guide. you know, guideline that talks about the other things. You know, the um, you know the public improvement feature and you know number of employees or desirability or, you know, the, all of the sort of the softer, more subjective things that... Maybe each one of those could add a, a percentage to the guide, you know, like they do. You know, <laughs> you know no, no, no. How do you if judge I, desirability? You know, if I may, I... Yeah, and if, if I may, I think the, the problem with setting a, like a 50% for five years, normally when a business comes to us, they come to us with a here at the end of the day here's the number i need and so we usually put the cap at that number and then back out of that how do we get to that number in five years we usually like to make it three to five years so that's how they're coming to us saying i need a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the day now if you say you're doing 50 percent for five years based on an increment maybe they're only going to get to fifty thousand dollars and you're saying well then they can come back to us again the problem is now we set the base again it's going to take them even longer to get to that because originally the base was down here and now your base is here and they're only going to create that much increment so they're going to end up coming back to us 50 times it's and that's dangerous having them come yeah, I don't yeah. Think come well but yeah but you could also come back based upon the the, the original base yes. number that you started with you, the, that the that the basis that your basis is the same as you originally came into the deal with mr pond well again what I agree with is it's not in the code, it's in the guidelines. And just like niche retailers or whatever it is we're talking about, we can come back and we can, can keep talking about this and see what, what feels right as we move forward. I'm not opposed to putting in the guideline. We're looking for something, you know, we're looking in the 50% in the, uh, over five years range in the guidelines. And understanding that someone can walk in the door tomorrow who wants 75% uh, for 10 years, and we still may have, have to have a conversation about that. And, and all you're doing is saying, oh, well, that's interesting. Because our, our guidelines are, are five years and 50%. So you want seven, 75 for 10 years. Well, we're going to have to have a conversation, and we're going to go to con you know, and we're gonna have to go to council. So in that case, I think it's fine you know, to put it in the guidelines and understand that it's, it's just, hey, this is where we're at right now. This is what we feel comfortable with. It doesn't mean that it's a done deal, right? Absolutely. It's just a guideline. It's not in the code. So the only code change is, is the minimum. Yeah, that works. So we've got... Okay. All in favor? <laughs> yeah. Do we have a? I think we're we're trying to get a consensus here. Of all right, what you're agreeing to is we have we got, we got, it. got it. Does she understand? Yeah. yeah. Madam Mayor. Mm. Joyce. Joyce. Yeah. I I want to make sure this is right. Um, consensus to accept both changes to the BDZ as recommended by staff. Yes. Consensus to raise the minimum level for the SDEP as recommended and that the rate and time are negotiable by staff and subject to council approval. Sure. Okay. Good job. Good job. She followed that. Part two of that. 
part two. Um, I know it's late, but do you guys want to um, discuss your agendas for um, the 30th? Uh, I have written up based on what feedback we've received, or do you just want to do this through email? I sent mine to Janelle. Um, yeah, that's what this is. There's still some discussion well, going around the emails. Some. Madam Mayor, are we? I think maybe it sounds like we might break and 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 talk about this. Is that okay? We're we going to make an official break? discussion. Do we need a? No. Well, I think it like adjour, adjourn and talk about it and give feedback. Can we do that? That's fine. We'll let's that. let's adjourn, unless there's something else. We have staff reports. Is there anything on staff reports that we need? I have a couple of things. He's reported. That's the staff report. All right. So let's Janelle. Mm. Oh, um, I just wanted to remind the viewing public that um, if they want to bring their ballots to City Hall, we have the 24-hour ballot drop-off box in the entrance lane to City Hall, and they can bring it any time of day or night. And then I also have a letter that I was asked to read. Um, <clears throat> it has been the pleasure of WASI Partners to partner with the City of Wheat Ridge and Renewal Wheat Ridge in making a sizable investment in the community that built the Wheat Ridge Town Center apartments. Wazi Partners remains bullish about Wheat Ridge. One of the significant factors in our optimism for Wheat Ridge is the city supporting the city's support for revitalizing 38th Avenue. I encourage you to continue to move forward in finalizing the concept plan and to commence construction plan development so there is no significant delay in realizing this vision for a downtown and main street. Our company continues to position ourselves to invest in Wheat Ridge based upon our confidence in the city and its reinvestment plans, both short and long term. We are strong supporters of revitalizing 38th Avenue as the main street of Wheat Ridge. The successful transformation of 38th Avenue into pedestrian friendly mixed use retail corridor will be a tremendous asset to this community we are confident that this public investment in the redevelopment of 38th Avenue will be a catalyst for significant private investment over the years to come. Thank you, Tyler Downs, Principal Wazi Partners. And I have copies for you, and I'm done. Okay, thank you. Can we adjourn now? Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>